Baltimore City Council Budget and Appropriations Committee. This is our 5 p.m. session, uh, Baltimore Police Department. This is our last session of the evening. Joined by Council President Jack Young. Uh, to my immediate left, Councilman Leon Pinkett, Vice Chair of the Committee from the 7th District. You, Councilman Bill Henry from the 4th District, member of the committee. Councilman Zeke Cohen from the 1st District. Councilman Chris Burnett from the 8th District. Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark from the 14th District. Councilman Brandon Scott, member of the committee from the 2nd District. You, Councilman Yitchi Schleifer from the 5th District, member of the committee. Councilman Ed Reisinger from the 10th District. Councilwoman Shannon Sneed for the 13th District, member of the committee, and Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton uh, from the 6th District. Uh, Commissioner Davis, thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, we're looking forward to having a robust discussion about public safety in the city uh, and what BPD is doing. Um, uh, when we get started, Commissioner, I'm going to ask um, uh, that you introduce everyone on your team, if you could just say their name and their position title. Uh, I know that you have a briefing today. Um, my hope is that we can get through that somewhat expeditiously, uh, hopefully in the, you know, the 20 to 30 minute time range so we can get right to the council questions. Uh, I know we've got a, a lot of good questions uh, for you today. Um, when your people are speaking, please make sure that they speak into the mic. As I've said at every hearing, if I politely or impolitely interrupt you, it is because you're not speaking into the mic. Uh, these uh, hearings are being streamed live on Charm TV. Uh, so we want to make sure that, that folks can hear what's being said. <clears throat> uh, before we get started, we have some administrative business that the committee needs to attend to. We are unfortunately still at an impasse with the administration on negotiations. Um, this is extremely frustrating. This council wants to pass a budget. This council strongly desires to have a partnership with the mayor and the administration, as I know that Mayor Pugh does as well. Um, Mr. Klein, we have $13.2 million in surplus, which you are trying to move uh, to fund balance for assignment to fire and police pension. It is my belief, and I think it's the belief of the council, that when we have cuts, significant cuts, to youth uh, programming in this city, which we direly need, that that is a very irresponsible move. And as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Klein, I'm not asking for a response. Thank you. As far as I'm concerned, you have a major role and responsibility for where we are at in this process now. Is there a motion so to move. amend service 793, Employment Enhancement Services for Baltimore City Residents, so reduced move. by $1 million on page 11, line 5, strike $2,346,168, and insert $1,346,000, $168. This is the Office of Employment Development Mobile Workforce Centers. So move. Motion by Councilman Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinkett. Councilman Pinkett? Yes. Henry? Yes. Middleton? Yes. Scott? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. Sneed? Yes. Costello? Yes. Is there a motion for Public Works New High Capacity Trash Can Initiative, Service 661, Public Right-of-Way Cleaning to reduce by $600,000 on page 15, line 14, strike $16,330,539 and insert $15,730,539. So move. Motion by Councilman Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinkett. Pinkett. Yes. Henry? Yes. Middleton? Yes. Scott? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. 
Sneed? Yes. Costello, yes. Is there a motion for mayorality related debt service? Service 123, general debt service. Reduce unallocated debt service by $6 million. On page 9, line 29, strike $83,216,943 and replace with $74,454,570. So move. Motion by Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinkett. Pinkett? Yes. Henry? Yes. Middleton? Yes. Scott? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. Sneed? Yes. Costello? Yes. Is there a motion for public works eliminate the municipal trash cans? Service 663, waste removal and recycling. Remove $2.7 million from the budget on page 15, line 21. Strike $28,225,593 and insert $25,526,415. So moved. Motion by Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinkett. Pinkett? Yes. Henry? Yes. Middleton? Yes. Scott? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. Sneed? Yes. Costello? Yes. Is there a motion? Mayorality related miscellaneous general expenses. Service 122, miscellaneous general expenses, reducing by 50% or $430,500. And page 10, line 12, strike $18,347,911 and replace with $17,917,414. So moved. Motion by Scott. Is there a second? Second. Pinkett? Yes. Henry? Yes. Middleton? Yes. Scott? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. Sneed? Yes. Costello? Yes. Is there a motion for police? Service 621 administration. Reduce administration budget by $2 million. On page 14, line 5, strike $54,996,533 and insert $52,996,533. So moved. Motion by Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinkett. Pinkett? Yes. Henry? Yes. Middleton? Yes. Scott? Yes. Schleifer? Sh Schleifer? Yeah. Uh, Sneed? Uh, Schleifer's absent. Sneed? Yes. Costello? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. All six motions carry. This committee doesn't want to do this. We want to get a deal done. Please bring that message back. Commissioner Davis, if you could begin your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening to you, Council President Jack Young and the rest of the council. Uh, this will be a brief PowerPoint presentation. Uh, thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak about the recommended FY18 budget for the BPD. I'm here with various members of my command team, and I will allow them to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Chief Sturgis to my right. Uh, good evening, uh, Chief Sturgis. I'm sorry, Chief Sturgis, Chief Financial Officer, as well as uh, Chief of Management Services Division. Good evening, Jason Johnson, Deputy Commissioner, of Strategic Services Bureau. Major Milton Corbett, the Commander of Special Operations Section. Chief Stanley Branford, Chief of the Criminal Investigation Division. I'm Dean Palmier, Deputy Commissioner of Operations. Ganesha Martin, Chief of the Compl DOJ Compliance, Accountability, and External Affairs. Major Byron Conaway, Homeland Security. Stephen O'Dell, Chief of Forensic Sciences, Evidence Management Division, and IT. Rodney Hill, Chief of the Office of Professional Responsibility. Good evening, Drew Vetter, Police Commissioner's Chief of Staff. T.J. Smith, Chief of Media Relations. Jim Gillis, Director of Government Affairs. Carlton Epps, Director of Asset Management. Elaine Harder, Director of Fiscal Services. Don Bauer, I'm the Executive Officer of the Criminal Investigation Division. Rich Worley, Inspector, Chief of Patrol's Office.
Thank you. The, the mayor and I, Mr. Chair, much like yourselves, are committed to reducing violence, improving community engagement, uh, enhancing constitutional policing in our neighborhoods. They are our top priorities. Uh, we are focusing our resources uh, department-wide on reducing violence, ensuring a safer city through this budget, and we have opportunities certainly to make improvements. As we go through the PowerPoint uh, presentation, I'm not sure who's controlling that. It's, okay, Chief Sturgis is. Uh, the uh, commanders uh, are aware which slides they're going to present, so we will just get right into the, the presentation, and I think Chief Kenesha Martin is up first. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Mr. President, and members of the council. Um, as many of you know, we've spent the past couple of years, excuse me, past year or so, um, preparing and negotiating a consent decree which was approved um, recently. Um, in preparation for that, uh, in fiscal 2017, the police commissioner reorganized the department to consolidate patrol and investigation functions under one bureau and created a new bureau for strategic services. Uh, this change was necessary to improve crime fighting strategies and address anticipated Department of Justice consent decree agreement. Um, as, you aware, as you're aware, we spent um, quite a bit of time on actually doing proactive um, reforms and under the Strategic Services Bureau, which Deputy Commissioner Johnson will speak about a little bit later, we've um, had quite a few successes. We've revised the use of force policy, enhanced the distribution of uh, policies, increased in-service training from one week to two weeks, uh, issued body-worn cameras with an auditing component, created a performance review board and use of assessment review board. We've designed tra a transparency webpage for community input. We've initiated a wellness program um, for managing stress uh, resulting from the nature of police work. Um, we anticipate that this uh, program will actually be um, in full swing um, by midsummer. Uh, it'll address basic mental and physical health issues, PTSD, stressors related to law enforcement. Um, and then just really quickly, um, I'm sure you'll have some questions, but the highlights uh, for um, fiscal 2018 is we anticipate being able to finally uh, deploy mobile data computers. Um, we also have instituted a new, um, uh, a new um, um, program at the at the academy, it's entitled Strategies for Youth. Uh, the point of that is helping police officers um, um, deal with um, youth, um, and not only um, realizing their cognitive abilities, but also that many of our youth come from um, backgrounds uh, that um, create PTSD in them as well. Uh, we are gonna have a technology resource plan, uh, a staffing plan. Um, we hope that our RFP for early intervention will be um, drafted and put out. We'll have a recruitment plan, a training plan, um, revised sexual assault policies. Uh, we should be able to institute our CIT training, which is training um, that addresses people in behavioral and mental health crisis. Uh, we'll have a, um, an eight-hour uh, training for wagon drivers transporting um, people and an audit plan um, that is part of the accountability plan that will go along with uh, once we actually institute policy, we institute training, then we'll have the auditing capabilities to make sure that we are doing what we're saying we're doing. So those are just a few things that we have planned for fiscal 2018. I've been before you um, earlier and talked about the different positions that we've asked for to be able to carry out this work um, that is in the, in the budget as well. So I'll leave that unless and, yeah. We'll just go through the entire presentation. Sure. Not a problem. And, and Councilman, I, I inadvertently skipped over the budget highlights um, before I turned it over to Chief Martin. So I'm going to very quickly go backwards just for about 45 seconds and just go over a uh, high level budget highlights. And there it is. So, uh, of the highlights, $10 million to support the BPD's consent decree with the U.S. Department of Justice, a $5.5 .5 million reduction. Uh, in our budget, and this is, involves rather $1.28 million to ground one helicopter, $839,000 to outsource building security both at BPD headquarters and City Hall, a vehicle reduction of $737,000, a reduction in telephone expenses of $604,000, 
and a $200,000 reduction in clothing and footwear expenses, and then $1.84 million in unspecified reductions that we're still working together with the administration uh, to identify. So if we can go two slides forward to patrol and Deputy Commissioner Dean Palmier. Good afternoon. The department is advancing an efficiency plan that will equip patrol vehicles with mobile data terminals, or better known as MDTs, and automatic vehicle location. These technology advancements will move the department closer to field-based reporting, which will be very efficient for patrol. Due to staffing shortages, we are not seeing the anticipated outcome that would allow officers to place more focus on proactive policing or community relationship building, uh, and we look forward to these efficiencies. Patrol officers are spending more than 80% of their time on calls for service, whereas best practices recommends no more than 60% on duty time addressing calls for service. We have over 250 officers on medical leave, although most of the extended leave is attributable to our current contract with the FOP. The department is navigating through a plan to shift administrative officers uh, to operations. One component of the plan increases oversight of sworn officers that are on suspension or medical leave. We've expedited review of all suspended officers. Our medical review team has been expanded to include a supervisor whose primary responsibility will be to hone in on the over 250 officers on medical leave or serving in a light duty capacity. We also hired an HR director with extensive experience in managing FMLA issues. We have also increased our relationship with the city's medical provider who evaluates our officers on medical leave. We anticipate increasing the number of officers returning to work full duty as oversight with the members and our contract at medical, medical provider enhances. In spite of the staffing challenges, we successfully engage in a number of community commitments uh, throughout the city. We've established the police chaplains program. We participate in Outward Bound. We participate in NFL 60. Bigs in Blue, Thread, the police commissioner has instituted a summer basketball league, building uh, bridges, badges for baseball that's run by Inspector Worley, our police explorers program within the schools, shooting for peace, uh, community stat, community conversations in particular districts, women in law enforcement, reading partners, youth workers, which we plan to hire 30 this summer, the youth academy, uh, youth Connection Centers, which were recently in, uh, introduced the, for the summer months, and also we had a grand opening of our museum. Citizens Academy and the bridges, uh, Bridging Officers and Students with Swimming, better known as BOSS. Fiscal 2018 recommended budget includes a reduction of $2.6 million from this service to provide funding for city schools, $737,000 for vehicle reductions, uh, this reduces the fleet inventory by approximately 67 vehicles. 1.84 million from Service 622 um, will be determined before the start of fiscal 2018. And I'll turn it over to Chief Branford. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of City Council. The Criminal Investigation uh, Division is focused on investigating crime and working closely with the State's Attorney's Office to ensure successful prosecution of all criminal cases. The division prioritized warrant service on repeat violent offenders. The division also identified patterns and trends to more effectively prevent retaliatory violence by violent uh, gang members and organizations. Uh, earlier this year, the family crimes relocated from BPD headquarters to the Baltimore Child Abuse Center. This move allows the unit to better connect with its uh, victims that's in need of their services. With that, I'll turn it over to Major Conaway. Good afternoon. We've improved collaboration and communication with federal and local law enforcement partners. We created the trigger pullers list and also launched our Gun Violence Enforcement Division, GVAD, that tracks gun arrests all the way through prosecution. We utilize, we utilize our analytical intelligence team to follow up cases from start to finish. The service aims to reduce homicides and shootings by focusing on criminal associates of victims, disrupting possible retaliation by rapid deployment, dismantling violent criminal organization drug crews contributing to violence. We also partner with the U.S. Attorney's Office and State's Attorney's Office to track gun arrests and enhance the prosecution of cases. 
I'll turn it over to uh, Major Corbett. Good evening. A special event, SWAT and Emergency Services Unit. Uh, the Services Unit uh, last year uh, completed 146 high-risk raids, and they uh, also participated in 17 hostage barricade situations. On weekends, we are deployed downtown to assist the safe dis uh, the safe safety of those that are downtown in the various clubs in the downtown area and around the Inner Harbor. And SWAT is also being used to assist and train across the agency to include working with the professional development and the training academy on service, several joint training exercises. Also, they are deployed in the various crime zones throughout our city. I'll turn it over back to uh, Byron. As I said earlier, we continue to have strong relationships with our federal partners to gain tougher sentences for violent offenders. The department maintains a close collaboration with City Watch to address criminal activity throughout the city. We have had great success with City Watch and look to build upon that. Uh, it has been particularly helpful in special events. So the, uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Council President, member, members of the City Council. This uh, next service, Emergency Communications, relates to our Police Dispatch Center. Uh, as you may recall, uh, communications prior to fiscal 17 was under the Mayor's Office of Information Technology and was subsequently divided uh, between the Fire Department and the Police Department. The Police Department is budgeted for and operates uh, Police Dispatch Center. Um, the budget this year is essentially flat for that service. It just accounts for uh, a transfer of three positions from the police department to the fire department, which essentially is housekeeping after the uh, division that occurred the last fiscal year. Turn it over to Chief Hill for internal affairs. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, under the Office of Professional Responsibility used to be the early intervention system. It was revamped last year. In fiscal 2017, the program was merged with the employee wellness and health and wellness section under the management service division. This move was made to remove the discipline stigma from the process. All supervisors are trained for the use of early intervention system. Also the director of the early intervention system meets with the commander and officer for any flagged warning signs with a plan to develop, uh, to develop a plan to correct and monitor behavior. Last year there were 217 interventions also, the Equal Employment Opportunity and Diversity section was transferred from uh, OPR and placed under the Management Services Division. This uh, change improves oversight of the section and is in line with the best practices for managing a fair and inclusive workforce. Uh, we continue to increase transparency and trust with the community by, uh, by opening trial boards to the public. Uh, we've seen an increase, uh, the total number of cases received, about 31 percent, the majority of which were internal uh, complaints, not external. Uh, the Office of Professional Responsibility has also seen the following improvements. The number of sustained cases are up by 21 percent. Uh, excessive force complaints and cases are down by 45 percent. Discourtesy cases or slash abusive language cases and complaints are down by 51 percent. Some of this we attribute to the Body One Camera Program, which appears to change behavior of citizens and officers involved. The uh, next service is records management. Uh, over the past two years, our field-based reporting project has been stalled due to funding challenges, but in fiscal 18 recommended budget includes a state grant that funds the full purchase of mobile data terminals, which is computers in the cars that we've spoken about often. This funding eliminates the budget gap for the purchase of field-based reporting equipment for all patrol cars, and we will proceed full steam ahead in fiscal 18 to launch uh, mobile data computers with field-based reporting, which will require a multi-step um, upgrade. Uh, our, once our field-based reporting technology is in place, it will reduce the time required to enter a part one report into the system. It will re actually reduce it to zero, which is one of the uh, metrics that we measure in this service. Also, the technology will provide officers with timely and actionable intelligence, which is a key to the crime fight. Um, the other notable piece of information for this service uh, versus fiscal 17 is evidence control unit was transferred to the crime laboratory service and uh, to, to change and improve efficiency of the evidence control unit. Major Corbett. Okay. Crowd, crowd traffic and special event management. Uh, this service is responsible for investigating crashes that result in life-threatening injuries or deaths provides tra traffic control along with uh, doing events and non-events and manage the coordination of special events within the city. 
last year, uh, there were 800 accidents that was investigated by our crash team. Out of those 800 accidents, 52 of them was fatals. And the crash, the only, not only do they do the investigation, they also evaluate the trends to assist in reducing uh, the accidents within the department. Uh, the, the economy impact on these special events uh, by hundreds, the impact by hundreds of the special events each year. Baltimore has several dozen high profile events each year which require the deployment of several hundred police officers. Special events has been critical in the security and police deployment of these events, which has resulted in nearly zero number of significant incidents at these events. Uh, the service prepared deployment strategies that allow the department to staff events while maintaining an appropriate uh, presence in other areas of the city. And those are the various events that impact Baltimore City is the Baltimore Marathon, the 10 Miler, Preakness, Light City, the Oreo Games, along with the Ravens game. Last year, over 70,000 hours, that means 70,000 police hours, were used for supporting special events. That's $2. million that was reimbursed from these events. And $1.9 million was unreversible. I'll pass them on to recruitment. So the next service is police recruiting and training. In fiscal 2017, we hired a new civilian director of human resources uh, and reassigned a police major dedicated to sworn recruitment only, which is housed within the Strategic Services Bureau. Separation of duties allows the department to focus on initiatives that will increase the interest in working for the BPD in both the civilian and sworn capacity. Although the last police contract brought officers pay more in line with surrounding jurisdictions, nationwide law enforcement profession continues to experience a decline in hiring. Uh, for calendar year, calendar year 2016, uh, we experienced attrition in the amount of 221 sworn members and uh, only hired 111. That the attrition numbers have stabilized and actually reduced just a bit uh, after, um, during calendar year 17, obviously we, we aim to reduce them more in the future. Uh, so far this calendar year, we've hired 71 new officers. We have 100 officers, just under 100 officers presently in the training academy, and we're going to start an academy class in the next two weeks of 40 to 50 officers. We have recruitment initiatives for Baltimore residents to increase uh, recruitment of, of those from Baltimore. Uh, Pizza in the Precinct, a partnership with Live Baltimore that shows trainees in the academy different residential areas of Baltimore encourage them to move locally. In an effort to reduce attrition, we have a public-private partnership to improve the working conditions of the district stations and the academy. The first district to undergo major renovations was the Western District and the grand opening will be held this summer. Fiscal 18 recommended budget includes funding five new um, academy instructors to implement the requirements of the Department of Justice consent decree. Uh, the budget also increase, in, includes funding for uh, in-service training backfill overtime, which will allow personnel to receive increased training and in order, again, to implement the Department of Justice consent decree. Our in-service training has increased from traditional one-week uh, training period to two weeks. So each Baltimore police officer receives two full weeks of in-service training every year, um, which is well in excess of the state-mandated minimum, which is 18 hours. Um, so we do 80 hours instead of 18. Um, effective June 1st, just the other day, uh, changing the marijuana standard uh, in terms of lifetime, uh, the lifetime cap on marijuana use has been eliminated, which uh, we believe will help us greatly in, um, by eliminating an arbitrary limit like that will al allow us to hire uh, more readily. Um, we're also seeing a change in the number of female applicants and apl African American applicants. Uh, those numbers have increased and we also have reinstituted the cadet program and we're currently processing applicants to be hired mid-summer for the cadet program. I'll hand it back to uh, Major Corbett. Once again, Special Operation K-9 and the Mounted Unit. Uh, currently, we have 26 uh, K-9 dogs, and the Mounted Unit, we have six K-9, I mean, six mounted horses. The K-9 and Mounted Unit assist with all aspects of policing from arrest to community engagement. Because of their superior sense of smell, and hearing and physical capabilities, the trained new law enforcement canine is a valuable supplement to the police manpower. The BPD canine dogs are trained to specialize in one or more of the following areas, uh, CDS control, uh, explosive, and guns, as well as apprehension. 
The support of the K-9 unit ensure the safety of the community members and the visitors in transit while attending events within the city of Baltimore. The K-9 team assists officers in the field on car stops and to re remove illegal drugs and guns from the street and on search and seizure warrants to identify areas where drugs or guns are secretly being hidden. They also determined, they, the, the teams also frequently requested by community groups and schools for demonstration which help improve the community engagement and build police trust. The Baltimore Police Department Mounted Unit is the national longest and continuous serving mounted unit in the, in the United States. They've been in existence since 1888. 1888. Uh, the mounted unit again has six horses. They continue to be extraordinary resources for the crowd control and also services as a force multiplier for police presence. The unit is, is used every weekend to be visible downtown for crowd control disbursement in and around the various downtown area in a harbor and the clubs. Uh, the mounted unit staff, we staffed 154 events last year and we also promote positive police relationship within the city residents show that we are ambassadors to the city of Baltimore. The Marine Unit. <clears throat> uh, the Police Marine, Marine Unit serves as a sole just, jurisdiction patrolling and providing year-round security on the 60 plus miles of Baltimore waterfront. Keep in mind there is no other agency that patrol the water waves in Baltimore. The Baltimore Police Department is the only one that controls the water waves, patrols the water waves in Baltimore. Uh, with that being said, is we have the Baltimore Waterfront and the Port of Baltimore, including Under Armour facilities, the Horseshoe Casino, and the Inner Harbor. And we have the eighth largest port in the United States here in Baltimore. Uh, we also have the Port Coventine development, will have a significant impact regarding boating, water safety, and law enforcement in, the, in and around that middle branch area. The, Mar the Marine Unit and Underwater Recovery Team are partnered with Homeland Security Investigation, the U.S. Coast Guards, and the FBI to operate as a team to protect the maritime critical infrastructure of Baltimore. We are ultimately responsible for the recovery of persons that are, that are found in the water. Law enforcement duties such as boating laws, enforcement, and safety checks. We often find that all the various drivers operate their boats while under the influence. We also uh, enforce that along with the marina crime prevention and regular conduct, regularly conducted, I'm sorry. Some of the marine unit duties include anti-terrorism patrol, the results in much of the, mar the marine unit being granted fund with no cost to the city. There's been several large events on a national scale that they have participated in, Fleet Week, Army-Navy game, the Baltimore Marathon, and Light City. Just recently during Light City, I don't know whether or not you saw this, they had an ATM machine that actually fell in the harbor. The Marine unit had to pull the ATM machine out of the harbor along with, they had a boat uh, that was on display, they had a bunch of umbrellas that was about to sink. The uh, Marine unit was able to go out and assist in removing that boat from sinking. Uh, they play a crucial role in, in part of safety and security for several other high profile and local events, such as the New Year's Eve and also Fourth of July. As you know that we have large crowds that come down to the Inner Harbor, and a lot of folks do not understand that the area of the Inner Harbor do not have a safety ring around it. So there's a few people that actually fell in the water during those times, so the Marine Unit is there to assist with them. And we also have a dive team. Okay, aviation. Uh, Foxtrot, as it, as it is called, we call, the, the police officers call aviation Foxtrot, is utilized in conjunction with existing crime fighting strategies. They work with ground units to identify problem areas and direct patrol to particular locations. Also, they alert, uh, they alert the problem areas and patrol them as part of their daily duties. If I can give you a situation that happened last night, we had one of our uh, officers working, they recognized a Lexus that was wanted in a homicide. Uh, the operator of that Lexus was a, a suspect in a homicide. Uh, the officer lost them on car. The, the operator jumped out of the car and started running on foot. Thanks to Foxtrot, we were able to follow 
uh, the suspect and take him into, into custody. Not only was he wanted for homicide, but he was also wanted for attempt homicide and two counts of first degree assault and robbery. So that's the importance of having Fox Trot in the air because it's a dual multiplier for the agency. They often see things that we don't see. They also allow us to, uh, if there's danger on the other side of that fence, such as a dog or an armed person, they see it before we see it. So it's important that we recognize the importance of the of Fox Trot. As I said to you, Fox Trot is a force multiplier to ground units. A one aviation crew can enhance the effect of ground units by two or three times during, due to the speed of movement and overall visibility of a sector. Uh, the service also assists with missing persons and vehicle pursuit as they did last night. They often uh, and crucially video crucial incidents of major incidents which, forward, which forwards the ability of the city to provide citizen media outlets with uh, footage of events which are enhanced uh, by public interest. Uh, I use as an example that uh, we have the Dirt Bike Task Force on Sundays uh, that we have out there every Sunday. Uh, there was a gentleman that was sitting on his dirt bike. He pulled out a uh, automatic gun, he uh, displayed it, it was through Foxtrot able to video that incident. We were able to identify that individual, pass that information on to the officers on the ground. We were able to apprehend that individual without him hurting a citizen in Baltimore. That's the importance of having Foxtrot. Uh, physical 2018 recommend, recommended budget ground, recommended they, they ground one of our four helicopters, which generally is a savings of 1.28 1.228 million for this service. But I must say to you that in grounding one of our helicopters, that means that you are putting us down by 25%. Yes, we have four helicopters, but we also have to have two helicopters ready and available at all times because we have two different flights that continuously fly over the city of Baltimore. So when one helicopter is down, that helicopter is down for yearly maintenance. So it's a rotation that we use those helicopters on a constant basis. Thank you. And your final service of the uh, presentation is the Crime Laboratory 642. The service covers the uh, crime scene, DNA analysis, serology, trace evidence, latent print analysis, firearms analysis, drug analysis, forensic facial imaging, photography, um, as well as evidence control uh, and quality assurance. So uh, your crime laboratory, you'd be happy to know, is the uh, third highest scoring service in the city. Uh, every single service among all outcomes, we are number three. We were number one in the public safety outcome and number two overall, so we do have room for improvement, uh, at least two, two points. Um, the uh, crime lab holds uh, multiple international accreditations, ISO 17025, 1720, along with certification of the uh, quality assurance standards of the uh, FBI um, program for uh, databasing, state licensure, um, all of which includes over a thousand uh, mandatory standards. Uh, we have made significant process or progress in securing funding to address uh, various staffing deficiencies to include a 2017 uh, supplemental allocation that added uh, 10 crime scene employees that have answered over 4,000 calls, which is uh, around 300 percent above the national average. Um, they've been put to good use along with the supervisors that were added that helped shore up the quality assurance system and lowered our overall uh, non-conformities in the uh, laboratory. Uh, this fiscal year evidence control was transferred to the lab um, along with uh, taking myself taking command of the body worn camera unit, uh, both of which are now pursuing international accreditation which is a first. Um, and along that line the uh, Body One Camera Program to this point has recorded over 90,000 hours of video, 520,000 videos, um, and as uh, Chief Hill has pointed out, has uh, contributed to significant changes in uh, behavior across the board. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation. We're ready for questions. Thank you, Commissioner and your team. Um, we just talked about uh, aviation and, and Foxtrot. Um, Commissioner, could you just uh, briefly, one or two minutes, um, describe the importance of that tool? Well, Mr. Chair, as you and other members of the council are aware, um, 
Most big city police departments in our country, uh, if not all, have a very limited vehicle pursuit policy because uh, bad things happen when police officers get involved in vehicle pursuits in urban environments. Typically, completely innocent people are hurt or, or killed. So, you know, one of, the, one of the many benefits to having a helicopter up in the air is it slows things down. And we don't have a pursuit policy. We don't chase cars in the city because we have uh, an aviation program that's allowed to follow the cars and call out um, where, where they're heading so we can tactically position ourselves and make arrests. Uh, the success that we've had with the Dirt Bike Task Force, and it's just a three-person task force, uh, I would say that in addition to the quality of the police officers we have assigned to that unit, uh, their, their biggest asset is the, is the helicopter. Uh, it's able to identify where the dirt bikes gather. It's able to anticipate their travel routes. It's able to identify where these bikes, and most of them are stolen, are stored, and allows us to follow up with search warrant applications, et cetera. Uh, it's critical for missing person investigations, particularly the elderly, the Alzheimer's patients who uh, are routinely go missing. And with the uh, infrared, the flare, they're, they're able to identify uh, heat signatures for people who are in wooded areas, et cetera, and that's been very helpful on a number of occasions. And with the recent spree of uh, juvenile, violent juvenile offenders, particularly with robberies, uh, our robbery arrests, our carjacking arrests have been really um, impressive of late. I, I wish those crimes didn't occur in the first place, but we've been able to close uh, a lot of those cases thanks to the presence of aviation. If aviation is up in the air and the bad guys are in a car, the chances of them getting away um, are slim to none. Thanks, Commissioner. So I think I speak for everyone up here uh, in terms of the dirt bike issue, and we all have uh, illegal dirt bike riders, which are a, public a significant public safety hazard uh, throughout each of our respective districts. Um, obviously, everything that, that you just said I'm familiar with, but I wanted to put it on the record of how critical of a crime fighting tool this is. So my question is, why is there a cut of a helicopter in the budget? Well, Mr. Chair, uh, coming up with a $5.5 million reduction in the budget, that's, that requires uh, hard work. And, um, you know, the, the decision to make that cut was, was done to eventually achieve that $5.5 million <laughs> Uh, reduction. There's a big price tag uh, that's always attached to any aviation program, mm -hmm. and that uh, provided a, an opportunity to uh, achieve or realize, rather, that $5.5 million reduction. But that wasn't your decision, was it? Well, Mr. Chair, I, I think as you and the rest of the council know that, you know, we, the police department, stand here uh, ready to present the BPD budget that was made uh, in collaboration with the mayor and her office. So as we present the BPD's budget, the BPD's budget and the mayor's budget are, are synonymous. Loud and clear, thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Klein, whose decision was it to cut the helicopter? Mr. Chair, before I answer that question, I wanna clarify that any general fund surplus in fiscal 2017 is gonna be needed to meet the city's commitment of $90.2 million in bridge funding over the next three years for city schools. So let's address that because that's not what you said to me previously. You said the $13.2 million surplus was going to go to fund balance specifically assigned for police and fire pension, period. <coughs> yes, you did. I told you this afternoon exactly what I just said. Mr. Klein, you can't continue to move the goalposts. You told me that's where the money was going. We went into these negotiations in good faith with the understanding that that money was available and you've moved the goalposts. You can't do that, period. So let's go on to the question at hand, which is whose decision was it to cut the helicopter? So the, the $5.5 million reduction to the police department budget um, was directed by the mayor because HB 684, which was passed by the General Assembly, requires that as part of the city's increased commitment to the city schools, it increase our maintenance of effort by $10 million, and that's, that's permanent, a permanent funding increase. And the mayor decided that um, it made sense to shift 
funding from the police department to funding for education and, and youth services. And so we worked with the police department. The police department provided uh, options for meeting the 5.5 million. Uh, and this is one of the options that was agreed upon. Who made the recommendation to cut the helicopter, Mr. Klein? Someone, made, someone had the idea in their head that they were going to cut the helicopter yeah. because it certainly didn't fly down here like a helicopter. The police department provided options. And so the and an the a la carte menu was provided. And, 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 the, mayor, made, and the mayor made the decision. To cut the helicopter. Yes. I don't believe that. I think your office made the decision to cut the helicopter, and I think it's an irresponsible cut. Councilman Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I've been, even though I know the answer to the question I'm going to ask you, I think it's important to have it on the record. I think that we all understand that we're in a public violence crisis in Baltimore City, and I've been asking all agency heads in particular, I know what your response is going to be, that I think it's time for the city to develop a comprehensive gun violence reduction strategy that would uh, create some kind of entity. I don't care if it's MOCJ or whatever the new uh, makeup of that office is going to be that would coordinate the efforts of all the city agencies around gun violence, allowing each of the agency heads and the agencies to focus strictly on their mission so that we can have a complete public health based, public health driven, public safety strategy in Baltimore. Can you talk about well, how your feelings are on that topic? Councilman, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of, of anything at all that will enhance our public safety efforts. And I think any society or, or any government that solely relies on its police department to be responsible for public safety is doomed to failure. So I, I support uh, any plan, any strategy that enhances the city's public safety strategy regarding firearms uh, specifically 2016 was the very first year uh, in our history that we met we tracked each and every gun arrest each and every gun arrest uh, from the moment of arrest to final adjudication so the arrests that were prosecuted and prosecuted successfully when the judges found those defendants guilty or the juries found those defendants guilty in 2016 60 percent of the time all or the majority of the sentences that our judges imposed on the defendants was suspended. So I think the gun violent enforcement division that the state's attorney established that we contribute a detective sergeant and five detectives is a strategy that's working. Uh, I, I think our focus on violent repeat gun offenders is a strategy that's, that's working. Um, just because the outcomes aren't what we all want them to be at the moment doesn't mean the strategy's not in place. So, so any coordinated effort uh, within city government that helps put pressure where pressure needs to be placed to, to hold gun, uh, gun offenders accountable is something that we're all in, we're all in support of. Thank you. Uh, my next question is to go back to the chair's uh, comment about the helicopter. So Mr. Klein, uh, the other day, uh, we had a, two questions, really. First, let's talk about the helicopter. So you said that there were options provided. So if just a simple look in the budget book for me and several of my colleagues, we noticed that, for example, the mounted unit is just about the same amount of money as grounding one of the helicopters. Well, if you go an average, uh, average citizen in Baltimore, they will say that, of course, the helicopter impacts more citizens than the mounted unit because the mounted unit is limited in where they operate. Can you help us understand, because for the life of me, I can't understand why you, the mayor, whoever, would decide to put into the budget book that we're going to eliminate a helicopter when there are other services within the police department that have the same thing, that don't reach the same amount of citizens, are available to be cut as well. Again, we, we did this in collaboration with the police department. Uh, I think Commissioner Davis could talk about the, the benefits. You know, he's talked about the benefits of the, of the aviation unit. Uh, I think he could talk about the benefits of the mounted unit. There's no need for that. My second, my second question, Mr. Klein, you know that I asked uh, earlier this week and last week about why the police department was not allowed to use uh, innovation fund money for field-based reporting because we know that it will help us save money if simply just from the overtime and then to hear tonight 
Deputy Commissioner Johnson say publicly that that has been stalled due to funding, it would lead me and my colleagues to believe, again, this is another reason why they should have been allowed to do so. And again, in a city where we're uh, cutting safe streets, where we're cutting after school, this is money that could have been used for other things that they now have to have in their budget because we refuse to use. This is it's innovative. Can you please explain to us officially why they, this is not something that could have been used for the innovation fund? The uh, councilman, the fiscal 14 budget provided $5 million for police information technology projects, and that was supposed to include field-based reporting. Uh, the police department could talk about how that funding has been utilized. Uh, we are f we are now funding police-based or field-based reporting as part of the consent decree. I know that that's my problem. You know that this council is holding a resolution. Uh, we don't feel like the police department. It's nothing against, of course, we all want a consent decree. We feel like that there are cost savings that can be had within the city government to provide services for consent decree required things before we allot them 10 million more dollars, including if they have to make technology improvements in the police department and we have or had an innovation fund, why can't why can't those funds be used for that instead of adding more money into a budget that so many people already want to cut? We know that we have to find efficiencies in their department, and it seems to me that the administration in the mayor's office, I mean, in the budget office, is creating an inefficiency by allowing this to not happen. First of all, I have not received a proposal from the police department to um, receive a, an innovation fund loan for that project. I do think that project is beyond um, what we currently have in the in the innovation fund and the budget committee has has voted to eliminate funding for the innovation fund in in fiscal 18 I understand that but also that you communicate with them you understand that they have to do these technology improvements you talk to them about that all the time it couldn't have hurt to just say hey maybe we should look at the innovation fund because it seems to me if just basic common sense I'm not the smartest guy in the room but if police officers are going from writing reports by hand, 30, 40, 50 a day, to being able to type them in, to their supervisors being able to read them faster, then we're going to spend less money on overtime. That's a cost savings to the city's, citizens of Baltimore, and it's going to allow officers to spend more time on the street. Right. That meets the qualifications in the innovation front in my eyes. Right. And, and, Councilman, we have had those kinds of conversations about this and other IT projects, but what it comes down to is the agency has to be willing to commit that once that project, once that new technology is in place, that certain positions are going to be eliminated. That's the savings. And if we can't get there, then it, it doesn't work as an innovation fund project. Commissioner, have you, do you have any thoughts about that? Councilman, if I could give it to uh, Chief Sturgis to follow up with some specifics. Yes, Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, 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 Mr. Klein is correct in fiscal uh, 2015's budget. Uh, we did receive a capital appropriation of $5 million uh, for IT uh, technology projects. Of that $5 million, two was programmed for field-based reporting. However, our need um, to roll out a full field-based reporting um, project would have been closer to $8 million. Um, the $2 million covered uh, maybe just um, to actual buy the um, mobile data terminals, just the computers and the vehicles. However, and in order to have a successful field-based reporting, there needs to be the uh, communication with our CAD system. So there's this uh, system um, upgrade, um, infra infrastructure upgrade that was required that cost several millions of dollars, which we did not have funding for. So for the $2 um, million dollars that was budgeted in fiscal 2015, we did begin the process of upgrading our infrastructure. Um, Throughout the consent decree process, we did um, appeal to the state to request additional funding to help augment the gap that we had. We did receive the $2 million. Now that we have that, um, we're moving forward with purchasing the um, MDT, the mobile data terminals for the vehicles. Um, and then the uh, funds that are available in the capital budget, we will continue to pursue the um, upgrades of the infrastructure. And I can tag Ganesha if you're available if you want to add more to that no you're good. Okay. thank you uh, mr. vice chair can we actually uh, request in writing from BBMR uh, a detailed explanation of why 
none of the police department's uh, technology requirements for the consent decree qualify for the innovation fund? Yes, and, that'll be question 82. And, and my last question, Mr. Commissioner, is either one for you or Deputy Commissioner Palmieri. I see that uh, we still have a line for uh, two lines, line for community relations section and line for neighborhood service officers. With the moving of folks from CSD back to patrol, can we talk about like what that division represents now? And if, you know, it's all in patrol, but if we're gonna next year differentiate to exactly where those people are now. So I'll start it and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Palmier. Uh, we still have a community services division. We reduced them uh, greatly in size when we sent back uh, 160 uh, patrol officers uh, to patrol uh, from non-patrol positions, and that was done right around February. So uh, we reduced them in, in size, but CSD still exists, and I think Chief Sturge is, is fine in the uh, line item. Yes, sir. Uh, for the neighborhood service officers, um, I am aware of this. Uh, this has been brought up in the past several couple of years. We have adjusted the budget to zero that out. Um, all of the funding is um, in activity three, which is uh, the community relations section. So what you're seeing in the budget book is the actual spending of uh, $257,000, which represents about two individuals that are charged to old legacy accounts, which we need to fix it internally. And I'll pass it to the Deputy Palmier if he wants to add any more. The only thing I'll add is, uh, you know, in, in this fiscal year, we implemented the neighborhood coordination officers within the transformation zones. Um, again, we went up to New York to visit that program. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a very productive program that we'll continue to invest in. And thank you. And before I step out to uh, speak at a graduation, Mr. Commissioner, I spoke with the fire chief about this yesterday, and this is something we've talked about before. I also think that it's critically important that we have a strong conversation about the utilization of 911 and making sure that folks understand and that we're allocating resources for 911 for emergencies. 911 is an emergency number, and with the resources being so limited in both police and fire, it's important that we relay that message to the citizens, but also that we as the agencies and inside government are making sure that we are pushing that message out and that we're making sure that people understand what they should and shouldn't be calling 911. And I would challenge the police department to try to figure out something innovative like uh, Chief Ford has with the nurse practitioners so that we can limit uh, the abuse of 911 for non-emergency police situations. Thank you, Councilman, and I'll uh, challenge Chief T.J. Smith to put his heads together with uh, the fire department for some type of uh, PR campaign because just like the fire department has that number dialed far too often, we have it, we have it done to us as well. Uh, Commissioner Davis, um, is City Watch under one of these services? No, sir. No. no sir. And, and Councilman. so does BPD play any role in, uh, I guess, in well, what, what, who, who's responsible for City Watch? I guess I should ask that. So, so the, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, okay. uh, it's in their budget, uh, and I'll ask Deputy okay. Paul Meir to describe it a little bit, but uh, we staff it. Uh, we have a police lieutenant there, uh, I think a couple more sworn, and some retirees that are under contract. Yep, so they're basically, uh, it's, it's one sworn lieutenant that oversees the program itself, but it is staffed by a, a private company along with some contractual workers. Most are retired officers. Uh, we do uh, have light duties utilize the cameras at times too. So I think so. So the city watch, well, CCTV cameras are listed as a future performance measure under um, Service 626. So is that related to city watch or is that different cameras? It it is yeah. it is um, because we do operationally provide support for city watch. Um, so that's why the performance measure is one of ours. However, the uh, funding is in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice budget. And of course, there's a co coordination between MOCJ, uh, BPD, as well as uh, MOIT, the Mayor's Office of Information Technology. And, and part of the reason I'm asking is um, this, the CCTV cameras are so critical to, to police work. Um, how, how do we, I mean, I'm just talking about from the police department, how do we allow Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to go this long without providing some kind of data or some measurement on their efforts to 
expand the, the infrastructure because you know I, I know I don't want to talk specifically about districts but I know certain sections of Baltimore where the police would want to have cameras you just can't put them there because the infrastructure is not in place correct and so not, not to, so somebody somebody's got to put some pressure where it needs to be placed so that you know infrastructure investments are made because right now they're, they're making communities more dangerous than they than they need to be Councilman, I'll say no matter what community I go to, and I'm sure everyone here, uh, one of the top five questions is can, can we get a city watch camera? And that the infrastructure uh, availability is, is, is a challenge. We have about 750 CCTV cameras uh, that, that we own throughout the city, about 250 more that are privately owned. Uh, it's one of the things that our city does better than most in the country, uh, but it's, it's a critical piece of our crime fighting tool when today's technology is so advanced that identifying people involved in criminal activity is is, is much easier to do now than ever before mm -hmm. and the the presence of a camera uh, much like a body worn camera it enhances the crime fight right um, and I don't know if this question is better for you or for mr. Klein and uh, you know and excuse me for just not knowing what it means but on many of the service um, areas there's a note that says um, this budget reflects the reallocation of grant resources from unallocated funds to those corresponding with specific services and activities, as well as revised unallocated amounts based on anticipated awards. Can, can, can you explain to me yeah, what that means? Yeah, I can talk about that. So I think we talked um, yesterday or the day before about the fact that in some services we will budget unallocated grant funding, mm -hmm. and that's in cases where the agency believes you know they're planning to apply for a grant but we don't know if they'll get it and sometimes they may not even know exactly what grants they're applying for but they're going to be actively applying so to avoid having to come um, go through the process for supplemental appropriation every time that's why we put unallocated then in future budgets um, some funding will move from unallocated to specific grant numbers because they, they have gotten a grant we know what it is mm -hmm. and and so whenever we have specific information about a grant we we use um, a detailed grant number versus unallocated okay um and so so that th that means that there's a significant part of the police budget that is unalloc under unallocated funds y yes yes meaning that there will be appropriation you okay with that commissioner but they haven't they haven't gotten the grants yet they can't spend it until they actually get a grant. Yeah, award. I mean, it, but I mean, as I look through the but, I mean, there's a lot that's unallocated. I mean, yeah. That, so, we, yeah, and you, you, we, had, you, had, and I'm not saying that yeah. we must have clearly we must have a very good track record at getting grants because to to put this much of public safety under unallocated funds m must mean that we, we we feel pretty good. Yeah, and Councilman, you had asked for a full yes. list, and we're going to provide that to you. And that that'll be throughout the entire budget of where we have unallocated grant appropriation and, and part of the reason I'm asking and, and, and it leads to my, my last question is that um, I believe about 10 years ago the housing authority we had housing authority police and it was a result of a federal grant that grant went away and housing authority police went away went away correct well housing authority is not part of the city well, no, budget. No, well I'm just yeah. I'm just saying that but but they were providing a service in a critical area right. for for law enforcement and so, you know, let, let's use Gilmore Homes, for example. Sure. And so we have not had that, you know, in that area for a decade. And I'm not saying that Gilmore Homes would look different. I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball, but it probably would have been different <clears throat> if, you know, that service was provided from some other entity. So I think that's why I keep bringing up the unallocated funds because there, there are critical services attached to these unallocated funds, and if we don't have a strategy of when these, you know, when and if these funds go away, right. then we leave whole communities, you know, vulnerable yeah. because n now, now the service isn't being met. Right, and I mean, as you know, we we rely heavily on state and federal grants, and uh, when they go away, it's a challenge. I mean, we I, I've talked about our practice of mm -hmm. um, the expectation that we we tell our agencies to have is that you know if grant funding goes away the service the service has to go away and and there have been exceptions to that that rule but but that's what that's the expectation that we ask agencies to have okay 
Councilman Slifer. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming in, uh, Mr. Commissioner and crew. Um, I got a couple of, of thoughts. Um, I actually have a lot more, but I'm going to be brief uh, because the sun's setting. Um, so the first thing I just want to state, you know, you mentioned about the perception, the perception of our city, the perception of our police department, the perception of everything. And, you know, what, what message would, is it sending when you walk into City Hall or you walk into the police department and you have, you know, robocops in there, you have just a security company hired by whomever, wherever, wearing whatever uniforms they're wearing. I mean, it just, it sends a terrible message. I know I've, uh, I actually walked into the police department not long ago, and I think you guys are already piloting this program? You have like security guards there? Well, we've hired them. You've yes. hired them, okay. So you walk in there. I mean, it's, it really is a, an uneasy feeling when you walk into the police department. And I could just imagine the feeling of myself and my colleagues when we walk into City Hall, and that's who we're relying on to protect us. Um, and so it, it really is a, it is a major problem. And if you think back to, you know, um, that council person who was killed on the job, um, you know, in, city, in, in, the make, in the makeshift City Hall at the time, I mean, it's a really scary thought, and you know, to what to what expense are we putting, you know, value on, you know, on our team, on our city, and on our people? Which which leads into my other thing, um, and that's the helicopter, which I think you guys have heard loud and clear. But you know, there's there's a cost there's a cost benefit analysis to everything you do. This is the second to last thing, and I've read through your budget. This is the second to last thing I would cut in your budget. The last thing I'd cut is the crime lab. Okay, and then this is the second to last. And when you look at the helicopter and you talk about just the basic numbers, how you're responding to 40,000 uh, calls for service on the helicopter, putting aside all the, uh, the other things that the helicopter does as far as homeland security and everything else, um, and you figure cutting just 25% of that, and which 10,000 calls, let's just say. So when you figure that at a cost of 1.28 million, I mean, you're talking about you know, $125 a call. I mean, I mean, it's a very relatively low cost um, per every call of service. And when you look at the incidents that occur, that there's high speed chases, and uh, we just look at in our city. I think the worst things that ever happen is when these innocent lives are are lost. I mean, nobody in this room um, doesn't think about Mackenzie Elliott and others who who are just innocent bystanders. Um, to a lot of the violence, and it doesn't take, uh, you know, watching more than two or three YouTube videos of, of high-speed chases to find that without the use of a helicopter, you're putting innocent lives on the line. And so whatever the cost is, and this cost is relatively low, I thought the cost would be higher. I mean, it's, it's reckless. I mean, it really is we are putting innocent lives on the line in our city. And, um, you know, we've made great strides in, in some of the transformation zones, and we still have a lot of work to do. We all agree on that. Um, but, you know, when you look at just people driving down the street, taking, you know, going, going to the grocery store, and you see these accidents that occur or you see them, you know, all these different uh, things that could happen that could have been avoided had there been a helicopter in the air, had that call, had that situation uh, been de-escalated, had it been slowed down, it makes a big difference. And, um, and I I've seen the worst accidents are as a result of chases and that's when we're losing human lives and I think that um, you know it, it's really at 1.28 million it's actually embarrassing that we're considering cutting a police helicopter um, now I'm sure there's plenty of other places not just in the police department and many of the agencies that there's room to cut but you know I don't I don't really care who who cut it because it doesn't make a difference to me I just care about who's gonna put it back and that's, that's the only responsible thing that anybody in this room could do. So, Councilman, if I could just re respond um, regarding your comments, and, and I know you're watching the sunlight, uh, about the aviation program and building security police officers. When uh, we're challenged to identify $5.5 million from our budget, it is very, very difficult to achieve that without laying off employees. So I know there's a public sentiment out there that, that may seem to look at our budget and think there's a lot of fat on the bone. Uh, I can tell you there's not. So to identify a $5.5 million reduction, it was a very difficult thing to do, 
especially when we knew we, we couldn't afford to lose police officers or lay police officers off. So I, I certainly understand your, your sentiments regarding aviation and, and building security. Um, just, just to follow up on that, um, before I ask my questions, it will make more sense to me to cut the um, security down at the stadium and the security at um, the casino rather than to cut the uh, security here at City Hall. So um, whoever made that cut is unacceptable to this council. And like uh, Councilman Slifer said, um, Councilman uh, Leone was killed. Councilman Curran was shot. Well, he had a heart attack. And you know we value our lives here in this building as well. Uh, we don't know anything about what security company you're looking to use or anything of that nature. Let's cut executive protection, okay, for you, for the mayor, and for the state's attorney, and keep those officers right here in City Hall. Now, if you want to cut, cut those, okay, you, 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 you're the commissioner, you have a gun, you have a driver who drives you around, so you don't need executive protection. Um, we can cut back on the mayor's executive uh, protection, and we also can cut back on the state's attorney's executive protection. We want officers here. The mayor's protected, the state's attorney's protected, and you're protected. We're not, and we want to be protected. So any kind of way that you can find within your existing budget, which I know you can, those officers who are charged with protecting City Hall, we don't want moved. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I think my only response to that, and I certainly understand um, wh where you're coming from, is I have- if, if you don't, we'll cut it. Well, Mr. President, you, you, you I'm sure know this. I have two police officers on my executive protection, and when I got here, there were six. So I understand the importance of making those decisions. I've, in fact, made them, and am willing to look at anything we can to ensure everyone's safety. Well, I'm the number the two in the city of Baltimore. I have none and I get threatened all the time. I have no protection. Anything happened to the mayor, I'm the mayor. But yet I have no protection, okay? I'm out late at night. I'm at meetings. I'm calling in complaints from drug dealers and they know it. And I've been threatened. I'm not afraid, but I've been threatened. Don't you think I want security as well? So Give us the security in City Hall. I don't have it. We can have it for the council. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I, I hear you loud and clear, and I know you and I have had personal conversations about executive protection for you, and if you'd like to revisit that, I'm certainly willing to have I would that like to revisit it for us here. I'll, I'll do both with you. Okay. Um, how much of the police department budget will cover crime prevention? Well, Mr. President, um, everything, that, that's a tough question. Um, crime prevention begins and ends with patrol officers. And as you're aware, Mr. President, and the rest of the council, one of the biggest challenges to our overtime expenditures is the fact that our patrol shift plan was negotiated in collective bargaining and inserted into a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, that's relatively un, unheard of in American policing. So when that happened, the collective bargaining agreement stands and still stands and requires the police department to have a four days on, three days off shift plan. And we never had the number of police officers needed to staff that in the first place. And then the riots and the unrest of 2015 hit and we only graduated one academy class and attrition became an issue and we've been challenged with staffing a shift patrol plan that doesn't work for us. But I can't hurl a lightning bolt at it because it's inserted into the collective bargaining agreement. So we're engaged in some good faith negotiations right now with the FOP to, to hopefully change that. Because more police officers on the street and mark patrol cars, uh, that's where crime prevention begins. How many um, police officers um, are still on um, extended medical leave. We like to have a list of that and how long they have been on because any other, and I think I said this to you before at um, other hearings, 
when a city worker gets hurt on a job, they give them a certain amount of time to either come back to work or find another job or they force them to retire either on disability or they don't have a job. We cannot continue to carry police officers on medical uh, leave for two and three and four years. Unacceptable. They need to find another job if they can't perform that. Yeah. So, Mr. President, I believe you're aware that the uh, FOP contract, again, collective bargaining, has a role to play with this. And we now have 209 police officers on light duty. And we're hopeful that we're in a position to have a better relationship with our medical provider because those are the, the doctors that determine duty status. I don't determine duty status. So we have 209 on light duty. We have 63 on medical duty, which means no duty whatsoever. Uh, they're, they're not coming to work. We have 47 who are suspended, and I cut that in half in two years. And we have 16 on uh, military leave. So all those, all those transitional vacancies add up, and they certainly impact So, staff. So what doctor, is it Mercy? Yes, sir. Because they're quick to tell the, the citizens who are citizens of Baltimore that work for Department of Transportation, Department of Public Works, Recreation and Parks, that they have to even come back to work. So I'm going to ask the, um, the chair of, of um, I'm going to ask the Judi Judiciary Committee to call in the um, provider at Mercy to find out why there's double standards. Yes, because sir. if they're not fit for duty, then they shouldn't be working. You know, I mean, that's taking, uh, putting money on the books, and we don't have officers in the street. Um, okay, um, can you inform the council on the police department's status of implementing the community policing strategy? So, Mr. President, you, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we reduced the size uh, of the community, community collaboration division earlier this year because we were at a very critical point in terms of our patrol staffing. Um, in terms of the community engagements that we are still very actively involved in, in spite of the, of the staffing challenges that we have, and our staffing challenges are very real. Uh, we have 500 fewer police officers in Baltimore in 2017 than we had in 2012, 500. Uh, in spite of that, we have a police chaplains program that, that's very uh, robust, and that's run by Chief Melvin Russell. Uh, we practically had zero police chaplains before the unrest, and now we have over 130. Uh, outward Bound, that's another community engagement strategy. Uh, every Baltimore police officer in 2016 spent a full day uh, at Leakin Park with a young person uh, in the Outward Bound experience. We have police officers who volunteer to coach for NFL 60. Uh, we participate in Bigs and Blue. Uh, all, these, all these things are new. Uh, for the last three or four years, we've been participating in a local nonprofit that supports academically underperforming students uh, called Thread. Uh, a number of us here in Chambers volunteer and, and read. And we have a basketball league that's in its third summer. Uh, building Bridges is something that's been going on for, for two years, and that's a after-school program targeting middle school students. Uh, Inspector Rich Worley runs badges for baseball. Uh, the BPD was conspicuously absent from badges for baseball for a number of years, and we're now involved in badges for baseball. Uh, police explorers, uh, we've, we've uh, almost doubled the number of police explorers since the unrest. Uh, we participated in a Shooting for Peace event last year at Coppin. Uh, we have a women in law enforcement um, that, that we, we think is part of the community outreach, reading partners. Uh, we're hiring 10 more youth workers this summer than we did last summer, so we'll have a total of 30. Uh, we are starting a youth citizens academy, much like our citizens police academy, but for young people. Uh, I have a youth advisory board, and this is also new, uh, bridging uh, officers and students with swimming. We have our police officers who swim with, with our young people, so all those events in and of themselves might seem like just one thing that the BPD does, but uh, combined in its totality, it represents a concerted community policing effort, but it's the police museum just opened, and that's open two days a week to the uh, community every Friday and every Saturday. But I've always been a proponent that community policing begins 
and ends with the interaction that police officers have with our residents. So the, the heart of community, community policing in, in, in my book has always been the respectful interactions between police officers and all of our citizens. And we've added a 40-hour curriculum to our police academy, uh, and we've called it a uh, foot patrol curriculum. Uh, and basically, it teaches communication skills to our police officers. Every academy class for the last, last six classes since I've been police commissioner has walked 90 days exclusively of foot patrol, and we think that's part of our, our community uh, policing strategy as well, Mr. President. Okay. Um, service 622, police patrol, on page 334. According to the performance measure chart on 334, the amount of time that, po that patrol officers spend on proactive policing is 14%. What is the department doing to shift police officers to be more proactive? So, you got it. So uh, again, sir, you know, with the staffing shortages that, that we're currently experiencing, again, optimally, we want minimally 60% of discretionary time for patrol officers. We're functioning at the rate of about 80% of discretionary time. Uh, some of the things that we've implemented recently, uh, just this summer, that we believe, and just let me back up, we, we cover 143 posts citywide uh, on, on the any given shift. So when you look at staffing those um, properly, the amount of service time is spent on calls for service obviously hinders their uh, interactions or, or uh, self-promoted policing. Okay, because um, lots of time I see police officers, um, they're sitting in the cars, it might be two, it might be four, they're talking to each other and they end certain uh, lots and right up the street is drug dealing and crime and, they, and I think I mentioned this to the commissioner um, on numerous occasions. What are we doing to get the officers out of the cars walking engaging the uh, citizens because that's being proactive. Absolutely and and to your point you know I'm, I'm out there quite frequently Inspector Worley the district commanders uh, when we see something that uh, appears where an officer's sitting in the car, uh, he may be writing a report, he may be handling a call for service, but we certainly inquire as to what they're doing and we continue to, to deliver expectations of what we expect them to do. We've uh, implemented a inspections component within patrol, so that inspection component goes through each independent district. They're act actively looking uh, for hot spots within zones, the district commander zones, and they're monitoring the activity of police officers. Um, as we mentioned before, the, the mobile data terminals uh, that are equipped with uh, the basically GPS technology will also have an impact for a first line supervisor, not only to account for the officer's time on call, but also their discretionary time and where exactly they are. So that's why we're really looking forward to that technology moving forward, because uh, in, in essence, um, we, we have to do it the manual way right now. Okay, well I can tell you for a fact, and I'm, I guess I'll start taking videos to show it to you, because they're not writing reports, they're just sitting in the cars. I'm telling you what I see and what I know. All right, um, service 620, 623, page 338. The performance measure chart on this page showed the violent uh, crime clearance rate declined to 20% and the homicide clearance rate declined to 28%. There's a note that says that the number are lower due to a different formula. Can you explain to the council the changes in calculating the clearance rate? So, uh, Mr. President, I'm trying to um, read this small print. I, I can tell you where we are right now. Our Homicide clearance rate at the end of calendar year 2015 was 31%. Our homicide clearance rate at the end of calendar year 2016 was just under 38%. And as of today, we're, we're over 50%, 57% uh, 50, 57. 57%. Um, that's an enormous improvement that I think um, the entire city should be proud of because we were only able to close a, a number of those cases because the community has stepped up. Uh, we've 
in, at the end of 2016, we calculated an increase in homicide tips alone at 116%. So that's thanks primarily to a text, a tip feature that Chief Smith added to our uh, public relations arsenal. And an increase in homicide tips of 116% is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, we, we think we put some internal processes in place and some um, relationship mechanisms in place with the state's attorney's office that we're seeing homicide and non-fatal shooting warrants being approved at a much faster rate than they had in the past. But we, we pay attention to that clearance rate daily. So if there's other numbers there that appear to be different than that, I'm not sure what they are. And if I could just add our homicide arrest numbers compared to last year have increased by 56%. Okay, so the numbers in the book are probably wrong. Uh, we're used uh, to that anyway. So I'm, I'm sorry. So, sure, sure, I can address that. So the numbers in the book uh, represent fiscal uh, 2016, which ended on June 30th of 2016, as the uh, commissioner reported. Um, so the number in the book is actual of 28%. However, the year um, ended in 2016 at 38%, which would have been um, calendar year ending December 31st of 2016. So that would explain the difference in the numbers that you're seeing in the book versus where we ended for the end of the year. There's a difference between fiscal year and calendar year. Oh, could you get that information to the committee? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, service 637, um, Special Operations, K-9 and Mallet Unit. Um, in regards to the performance measure chart in this particular um, service, can you provide the council with a breakdown of how many arrests were assisted by the mounted unit versus the K-9 unit? Um, please provide this information for the past five years. We'd like to have that information. Okay, I I'm not sure that we have that specific information, um, but Major Corbett will certainly compile that and we'll get it back. Okay, thank you. Um, and we got my last final year. I'm question. sorry, Mr. We got last year, Mr. President. If you want, okay, last year. we'll we'll take whatever um, you have. Just make sure you get it to the committee. Yes, whatever sir. whatever data you have with the K9 unit versus the um, unit. mounted unit. Just get that information to us. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Um, last question: um, Overtime. Who is responsible for? Uh, monitoring the overtime in each police district, who authorizes it, who monitors whether the overtime is being used to patrol or whether it's used to be just sitting around. We don't want officers, uh, you know, Mr. Commissioner, I told you, I don't mind paying overtime if we see it reducing crime. But just to see officers sitting around and not engaging the community, just sitting in cars is not what we want. We want them out and about, and we want them engaging the community. That's community policing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But uh, I want to know who oversees overtime, and are they checking it? Because what I've read about the lieutenant at the horseshoe and other issues that we have heard about is very troubling. So, Mr. President, that... Um there's a lot to be said about overtime, and I think it was back on April the 4th of this year that uh, Drew Vetter gave an overtime presentation to the uh, Public Safety Committee that was probably the most comprehensive uh, in certainly recent years. And overtime in any police department is, is uh, a normal thing. And if overtime goes toward enhancing the crime fight and getting a clearance rate like Homicide has this year of 57%, I think we all agree that overtime is a necessary evil in our profession because we deal with human behaviors and we can't often predict human behaviors and unanticipated critical events to include crimes. Um, but I, I do want to acknowledge again publicly that corruption, mismanagement, abuse has occurred here for many, many years and there are seven police officers who are sitting in a uh, federal jails across this country awaiting trial uh, partly because of their involvement, amongst other things, and an overtime abuse, criminal overtime abuse scandal. The lieutenant that we just suspended 
uh, last week, and I have to be careful what I say about this because it's a pending I understand. criminal you matter. But you only have to go into it. But I'll say this: this is some of the things that we, we identified them. We we identified them internally. We identified them and we locked him up. He didn't get indicted. We the BPD put handcuffs on him. We we're the ones who arrested him. But but the point I'm trying to make, Mr. Commissioner, who is responsible for assigning the overtime and making sure that they work in it? That's all I want to know. Yes, sir. So it begins and ends with, with patrol sergeants, and there's checks and balances, and we just revised our overtime, overtime policy. policy and approval. Uh, the challenges that we have with overtime are, are a lot structural challenges. Um, again, the patrol a patrol shift schedule that we can't staff. Every day we know we have a patrol shift schedule that we can't staff, and, and that's, it's not normal to have that inserted into a collective bargaining agreement. So there's a technology fix to all of this that the mayor uh, has uh, or is putting into place a, uh, an audit that's going to identify undoubtedly, at least to me, some IT uh, solutions to our, to our paper process. Um, it, it should be virtually impossible to say you were somewhere and us not to know whether or not you're telling the truth. And, and IT, I think, is going to solve that for us. Okay, um, I, I just feel that um, okay. we, we should work as hard as we can to get that FOP contract reversed, where you will be in charge of scheduling. Because we're at the point now of calling out the FOP for the crime in the city of Baltimore because of their schedule. You know, because if you're the commissioner, you can't control your schedule, then that's a problem. And I doubt if any other police department in this state have that issue. Only us in Baltimore City. You're correct, Mr. President. Chief Sturge. Okay. So, uh, sir, I just wanted to add in um, regarding the um, IT solutions that the department is looking into and moving um, forward on expeditiously is we are looking at automating our um, timekeeping process, uh, which should help in um, some of this uh, authorizing of uh, the overtime. Uh, there's three um, solutions in particular that we're looking at. Uh, we are looking at the biometric um, time clocks where individuals will have to use their thumbprint to, to, to clock in. Um, we are also looking at the uh, solution of the web um, application for those who have desktop, and we are also looking at a mobile app, um, smart, smartphone mobile app um, solution with a geofencing, so individuals as they are reporting um, to a, a crime scene, um, they can sign on with their smartphone, but there will be that geofencing um, solution which ensures that they are not too far away from where they say they are. Uh, so th that is the uh, technology solution that the uh, department is looking at. Um, that will be um, implemented in fiscal 2018, um, hopefully before the end of this uh, calendar year. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to take a moment to thank Charm City TV. They've been recording these hearings all week and shifted their schedule around, so we really appreciate it on the council. Um, and the great thing about Charm TV is that they put all of their hearings, all of our hearings, on YouTube, which means you can go back and listen to those hearings. So when you're recounting a story, you can go on there and you'll know exactly what was said. So, Mr. Klein, you just told me that the 13.2 million was intended to go to bridge the gap funding, okay? Now, when did the mayor make that commitment with the General Assembly when did, the, when did the mayor make the $22.4 million commitment and Delegate McIntosh made the $13.9 million commitment, right? And then the governor came through with a supplemental, maybe 22.8, if my math is correct, right? That happened in April, right? Okay. So let me bring your attention to this YouTube video from our budget committee hearing on May 16th, okay? And this is your deputy director, Bob Senemi. Get back to your question, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. With the surplus, um, the $13.2 million, if it materializes, because this is still a projection, and it could come in at that amount, a little bit less, a little bit more. But if that surplus materializes, what we're proposing to do is to put it towards these categories, um, to beef up our F&P pension litigation contingency fund to make sure we have the full amount um, covered. 
um, and to throw more at the BCPS line for surplus schools and debt service, which will be used to redevelop or demo those buildings that we have. Why, are, um, why would we take that money? Can you remind me where F and P pension and school debt service, what accounts those are in? Those are in fund balance? So the fire and police, he, what, what um, Mr. Senemi is referring to is within our assigned fund balance, we have a contingency in the event that we lose the fire and police pension litigation. That would require us to make retroactive payments mm -hmm. To the pensioners would yep. be the difference. Mr. Klein, you're, you're, you're uh, uh, Councilman, can I, can I hold on, Mr. Mr. President, if I may? You're, you're confusing the facts, okay? There's a fund balance. There are three assignments within that fund balance $50.0 million for fire and police pension, number one. Number two, $17.6 million for school building surplus debt service. Number three, $2.5 million for body cameras for a grand total of $70.1 million. Mr. Klein, your deputy director, a month after the mayor made that commitment, said that that $13.2 million surplus, if it was realized, keeping in mind that number is uh, current as of March 31, was going to fund balance. And you told me today that you never said that and that your department never said that, but I got it on the YouTube tape right here. And I can't understand at what point in the decision-making process you bit magically decided, maybe it came down in a helicopter, that you were not going to put that money in fund balance and that that money's going to bridge the gap funding for a commitment that the mayor made a month and a half ago. Mr. President, I got to tell you, I got good mind to talk to you after this about bringing him in front of my judiciary committee, subpoenaing him, and putting him under oath because it seems like you can't seem to find a way to tell this committee the truth. You're hiding stuff over here. You got the, the money for the benefits over here and the fringe over here, and there's always an issue with the budget book none of the numbers are correct and I can't understand when you get a simple question a simple question about where you said you were putting that money you're lying to this council about it mr. president well you just summed it up because we argued the point that we didn't want the money to go in the fund balance we wanted to it, 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 it's already what 70 something million dollars in there 70 and, they have, and they haven't even used any of that money not a dime of it and we steady growing that pot we're steadily growing the, um, um, good God, I'm, I'm so dead, going upset, I almost cursed again. But um, we're growing money into um, our stabilization fund, okay? Uh, we keep putting money there. I mean, we're just putting money away and away and away. And I do agree that we need to put money away in case something major happened. But nothing has happened. The, the worst thing that happened to us was Snowmageddon. Okay, and we got reimbursed for most of that by the federal government. We just need this money. This was the easiest budget that we could have done. 13.1 million in surplus money. We could have had this budget done. Everybody could have been happy, standing up saying rah, rah, rah. We worked together to get it done, but yet we're fighting. And at the end of the day, we're gonna have close to what? 40 something million dollars. right now we have 15 and a half million cuts mr and cuts. president mr chair in the same well, hearing mr klein we, i'm we, not interested mr klein mr klein i'm mr klein fiscal 18 mr klein i am chair of the committee schools. mr klein you're out of you order chart, mr. mr klein chair. i'm not going to tell you again that you're out of order this is my committee not your committee the president has the floor mr president yes and 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 i i, I just feel that you know this whole process has been disingenuous I don't have time to be sitting in here fussing and arguing and fighting for the same priorities that the mayor has as well these are our children our citizens and the things that are important to this body none of us up here wanted to sit here and make cuts we want to move forward but if we don't get our priorities met these budget cuts will stand. Any supplementals that come in here are not going anywhere. So we want to let you know we're serious about our business today. And we are not going to stand for nothing less than our priorities being met. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. President. Any supplementals that come in, you can consider they're just going in a drawer and collecting dust moving forward. If this is the type of cooperation we're going to get from BBMR, I just can't understand it. And, Commissioner, quite frankly, I appreciate the fact that you got a job to do. 
but I am sick and tired of this BBMR making operational decisions. You are not a police commander. And further, I'm sick and tired of you making political decisions. You are not an elected official. I don't know how often we got to go through this. It's the same song and dance every single time in front of this committee. BBMR has absolutely no respect for this council. Councilman Henry. Good evening. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say to the chief of the three different um, solutions you're looking at to um, to do the better uh, time card management, um, I would encourage the biometric route because while I was sitting here listening to you, I thought of ways to beat the other two, but I, I still haven't been able to think of a way to beat the biometric one, so that would be my vote. Um, uh, okay, the, the only reason for the third one is that we do have a mobile workforce, so when officers do have to respond to the scene, we don't have the I, Yeah, I know, it's a tough okay, one. It's just that the smartphone thing, I'm like, here, sign me in, you know, or take my phone and, you know, I, 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 just, I worry, we'll I worry that there would be a way. But, okay. but I, listen, thank you very much for the fact that you're trying to find a good way around it. I appreciate it. Um, service 622, police patrol. Um, oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, before I begin, uh, uh, Commissioner, I'm, I'm looking at you, but I'm speaking to your whole staff when I say, I'm looking for short answer, not essay. Like, this is, th these, aren't, these aren't tough ones. These are, these, these are just like basic data things. Um, I'm reading the service description for 622, which says it consists of the nine police districts. This is patrol. And the units assigned to patrol are sector patrol units, administrative unit, Inner Harbor Unit, Casino Mini District, Downtown Foot Deployment, and Operations Units. Um, and Patrol also is responsible for the adult and juvenile booking facilities. The, um, the page in our budget book, the agency detail for Service 622, aggregates all of those different units. Could we get this page but broken down so we can see how many of each officer, how many of each sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and so on are assigned to each of the nine police districts, and then inside that, how many are assigned to sector patrol, how many are assigned to Inner Harbor, and so on. I can kind, I'm guessing I can recognize the casino mini district, <laughs> because it's, I'm guessing that's the special fund one, but I might be just guessing. So can we, unless somebody actually has that right here to submit to the committee, can we make that something that you turn into us? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hang on, Councilman Henry, what number are we on? That's 83. Uh, Councilman, can you please repeat the documentation yes, request? Yes, what, what I would be looking for would be the service salaries and wages for permanent full-time funded positions in service 622 broken down by the various units assigned to patrol as per the service description. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, thank you. Um, now, just a quick data question. I, in that list, there are only eight majors, but we have nine districts. What, what, what am I missing? <laughs> Councilman, you're not missing anything. We just made promotions. Oh, okay. All right. So there, so. Nine majors. There, okay, but you've yeah. only budgeted for eight. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like there's only eight budget positions for majors in patrol. Okay. Well, we have nine. Uh, yeah. We we definitely had nine. Um, we had some reorganization, so we just have to clean up the budget. Do we for get that. to give you suggestions on who's working for free or? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So sure you you'll get you'll get that cleared up. Yes, I think that's just okay. a, something we gotta clean up. Um, what are community service officers? Because they don't look like they're paid enough to be actual police officers. Administrative, yeah, they they are um, administrative um, positions um, in, in each out in the out in the districts. Okay. Yes, yes, they are civilians and they're scattered they're throughout the okay. department. Okay. Um, now, service moving on to service six thirty seven, the canine and mounted unit. Um, I'm my several of my colleagues have spoken to the mounted unit, and I will not beat a. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will just I'll stop there. Um, but 
Um, listen, I'm a dog person. I like dogs and all, but I'm a little curious on why we need 25. Um, what I mean, how it, they're clear they're not part of patrol, so they are not on a like 24/7 rotational. Well, thing. Councilman, Councilman, there's different types of of dogs, and with two uh, major stadiums in the city, explosive canines. We, we have a number of explosive detection dogs. We have a number of uh, drug dogs, narcotic dogs, and they participate in interdiction activities uh, throughout the city. And then, then you have the patrol canine dogs, and I think that's typically what people think of when they hear canine. You have the patrol uh, dog, but we also have explosive detection so, dogs. So there, there are Excuse me, there are canine units that are patrolling in neighborhoods? Sir, if I, if I can, they, they fall under special operations session. That's why they're under that service. However, they, they do work within the nine districts. So they, they communicate on the same channel. They're not assigned under district command okay. for, for obvious reasons. They have a, a specialty skill or spe uh, that really needs to be, um, uh, has have strict oversight. So that's why they're centralized under special operations, but they are a support function. They operate within the districts. They monitor the radio channels. They respond to calls for service. They back up patrol officers and so forth. Are, um, okay, now I, I, I swear to you, I mean this totally seriously, but with the dogs that some um, are used for explosive searches, some are used for narcotics, is it possible to cross train dogs you can't have them learn to recognize both? it's it's um, not a best practice so in the past we have had dogs that were cross trained but best practices will show that that is not the that, that is unreliable and, so, and councilman on top of that it provides def criminal defense attorneys a very easy challenge when it gets to court because uh, they, they can make an easy argument that the dog isn't um, okay. specialized as we say I, it is I can get that um, what now, as a follow-up though, is it not possible to have one human being work with more than one dog? That's like, why do you need, because it appears from the salary, I mean, the, the position breakdown, it looks like th there's a person in this unit for every horse and for every dog. And is it not possible to have one person? Uh, I'll say this, there are some jurisdictions, uh, large police departments that have one canine handler assigned to two dogs, and typically it's a patrol dog, and it's a- Specialty dog. A narcotic dog or a bomb dog. Right. Uh, that requires larger vehicles, uh, typically large SUVs, to be able to transport them around together at the same time. So, and we don't- Why would you have to bring both dogs with you? because you don't know what you're going to be called to, to do during your course of duty, necessarily. Uh, and, and oh, right, because those are the patrol, like, what, no, here's what, I'm, what I mean is, if you've got, like, so if you've got 25 dogs, how many of them are explosives, how many of them are narcotics, and how many of them are patrol? We have nine explosive dogs, the rest of them are CDS dogs. Nine, C, not, okay, I'm sorry, nine explosive and 16 CDS. That's correct. Right, so... I guess what I'm saying is if you, so, so, so none of them are just strictly patrol dogs. We use all of them for, we can use all of them for patrol, but the specialty is if, it is if there's a call for a bomb threat, we prefer to send a dog that's been specifically trained for those types of traffic. That. So, that's but correct. Why couldn't that dog just stay back at the kennel and you go get him when you get an explosive call? The, the dog must stay with the handler. That is the best practice. And the reason why is that dog is adjusted or familiar with that trainer or that handler. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to have three handlers to handle one dog. Okay, all right. Um, it, it gets into a lot of courtroom credibility issues when we, when we go to use these dogs and, and make arrests. Um, can you repeat the light duty numbers that you r did earlier? There was the light duty, there's medical duty, and there's sure. suspension. So as of uh, the end of May, uh, and, and these, Councilman, you know, these, these numbers change daily, but we have 209 police officers as of the end of May on light duty. We have 63 on medical leave. We have 47 who are suspended administratively, and again, that number is cut in half, and we have 16 that are deployed in the military. Uh, we, we made such great strides with 
cutting our suspended officer list in half. I'm convinced we can do that with light duty and medical duty as well, uh, but we can't do that on our own. We have to do that in, in conjunction with Mercy and, 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 the, and the FOP because there's a contractual obligation in there that we have to comply with. Um, assuming that these numbers are across the entire police department and not just patrol, that, is that correct? Correct. Could, could we also get as 80, what are we up to? 84. Could we get as 84? Could we get that list broken down by how many from patrol in each of those categories? Yes, sir. Okay. Because um, look, just looking at this, uh, you're well over 10% of the force is on there. And I'm just curious as to whether I would like to believe that a disproportionate number of these are coming from patrol, which is good and bad because patrol is at most at risk of you know different kinds of injuries and such, but it also means that patrol then is even greater under, even further under strength. Yeah, I, I can, oh, okay. if you want the numbers, I can sure. read them to you. So for um, uh, police patrol, um, give me one second here. I'm, I don't have my glasses. The <laughs> So police patrol for limited duty, that's light duty work, we have uh, 68. Oh, that's not bad. Um, that this is police officers, so uh, that this doesn't include supervisors. So for those that are medical, we have 42. Okay. Those that are suspended, we're looking at 16 total. It's also good. Detailed out. Uh, yeah, so detailed out full duty would be um, 22. Detailed out light duty would be about seven, it looks like. Okay, so detailed out, the number of patrol is higher than the total number. Well, I'm sorry? The, the number that was said, quoted for military was 16. Did I hear, did I mishear that? So I'm sorry, mil military is uh, seven. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yes. All right. Yes. And, and so the 22 is something else. Yes. Yeah, so the 22 is uh, officers that are detailed out full duty, which means basically they've they're in a transfer phase, promotional phase that um, we're rectifying, reconciling, neck doing. It's pay period to pay period, basically. Gotcha. So just to clarify, that is not medical. Uh, right. Full duty detailed out that mm -hmm. 22. So please don't include that in because we were talking about medical. Gotcha. And that 22 is a full duty that is detailed out of patrol. Ah, uh, okay, to somewhere else. I yes. Gotcha. Some, gotcha. Correct. Um, uh, for communications, uh, my understanding, and I, I'm sorry to say I got this understanding from the internet and social media, so that's why I'm talking to you guys. Um, our radio system was down yesterday, and the word on the street was that BPD had no backup for the radio system being down. Um, can you provide some reassurance that not everything on social media is true? It's not true. <laughs> so, so the so the, I'll handle that. So the the uh, the cause of the of the failure, first off, it had to do with uh, a mistake in uploading some software by our vendor, which is Motorola. Uh, we met extensively with them today and went through it. Uh, seems to be basically a freak accident that's never happened before, but. Human error essentially is what happened. Now, as to the backup plan, there there was a backup. A backup was used um, because it's a backup. It's not the best way. To, it's not a way. So to, what what's, what is the backup? There's a mutual aid channel that works citywide. So we had to put all of the units temporarily, and I mean by temporary, I mean a matter of several minutes, uh, on a citywide channel. So every single oh, okay. police officer on one channel, which you could never do for an extended period of time, but you can do it for a short period of time to give instructions as to what to do next. Gotcha. After a fairly short period of time, the system essentially reboots itself, which is called FailSoft. FailSoft works as a radio system. Again, it doesn't work as well. Um, officers were able to return to their normal district channels, but dispatchers had to use um, handheld portable radios like police officers carry. Dispatchers had to use those same uh, radios. And so we were in that condition for about fail soft for roughly an hour, and then the system was completely uh, restored and we were back up and running. So there was no service interruption. There were no priority calls for service that couldn't be answered. There was no extended period of time that police officers couldn't communicate with each other or with the dispatcher. Um, 
again, met with Mot Motorola, obviously had to fix the problem yesterday. We called them in today, uh, us and the fire department, and had um, uh, an extended conversation with them today about causes and, and ways that we can prevent this in the future. And also, as a side note, um, there was a lot of conversation about having a better backup plan than we had. I mean, we had one, we em employed it, it worked, but there's always room for improvement and, and we, we expect to do better. Thank you for the reassurance. The last uh, thing I would say, Mr. Chair, is, um, uh, well, first of all, you know, thank you all for your service and Commissioner, please, to almost everyone on your force, thank you for your service. Um, and I, I, I mean that seriously because, you know, you have some jerks, but it's hard to not have that in a 3,000 person organization. Some of us are in significantly smaller organizations and recognize the challenge. Um, I, I, I would say though, I would like to, um, I would take issue with one of the statements you made earlier um, that crime prevention begins and ends with patrol officers. Um, I would hope that, that you would mean that statement as hyperbole to show support for your patrol guys. Um, because I would understand the importance of doing so. But I would hope you would also recognize that crime prevention really begins with people not needing or wanting to commit crimes. And um, I mean this seriously when I say I don't believe we should be relying on the police department for crime prevention. You know, you guys, you, the, the, the part of crime prevention that police address is the opportunity part. You guys don't prevent means and you guys don't prevent motive. Um, and there are other organizations both in and out of city government that really are better equipped to address motive. And um, what I will say though, and this is where it's a challenge for you and for us, is finding the balance in we, how we allocate limited resources to addressing that. Because everybody wants our kids to be um, great kids and we wanna give them the best pop possible opportunities. And um, those opportunities aren't free. Um, giving kids meaningful things to do with their time so that you guys don't have to chase them is something that requires resources, and um, and it is a it's a tough call for government, and it's a tough call for society as a whole to balance the investing in the future, so that we're not scared in the future with investing in tonight, because people go to lots of meetings and they talk about how important it is to invest in our kids, but then when they get home and it's night and they look outside and they're scared, they call the police. And if you're getting 1.2 million, is that still the number we're looking at, 1.2 million calls for service? Is that up, is that down? Yeah, total um, numbers is uh, 1.2 million into 911, however the police responds to right. about 830. The, the, um, that's actually, pre that, that sounds good. It's down from last yeah. year, but up from but as long as the people of Baltimore feel like they have to call the police for every single thing that they see, it's going to be hard for um, it's going to be hard for people in City Hall making database decisions to attribute more resources to true prevention um, and less to response. And that's the thing, because we, we want the response, but it's, the response, in all fairness, is more expensive than the prevention. Okay. Uh, Councilman, I think I've extensively been on the record, uh, very progressively, I, I agree with you, and I hope that we get there one day as a society. Uh, but in the meantime, the demands of, of our police department uh, continue to grow and grow and grow. We are the profession that is in the that can't say no business. And, and that's a challenge for us. So while we have 500 fewer cops, some people might look at that as a good thing, but there hasn't been a reduction in the demands for police services over the fa past five years. And, and, and Commissioner, that's our job. Okay. Our job is to say no. Our job is to turn to our constituents 
and say, no, we can't keep relying on the police to do everything. We have to do something else. I'd be also. glad to be put out of business. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, Commissioner Davis, I just wanted to follow up quickly on one of Councilman Henry's um, previous questions. So if Scooby-Doo was on the K-9 unit, <laughs> would he require a position associated with him? Please don't answer that. It's been a long week. <laughs> Councilman Burnett. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. You, you guys, you, you, have narco you have explosives and CDS dogs. See, I'm fairly certain that Scooby-Doo is a Scooby snack dog. Councilman Burnett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'll try and keep my questions short. Um, first, early in the presentation, it was uh, mentioned that the uh, department has spent close to 70,000 hours at, in events coverage. And of that time, um, $1.9 million was unreimbursed for that. Uh, can you explain why? Well, uh, unlike other jurisdictions, uh, we don't get reimbursed in entirety for the dedication of police officers to special events. So let's talk about the Ravens and the Orioles. The Maryland Stadium Authority reimburses the BPD for Baltimore police officers who are assigned inside of those stadiums during those games. But the resources that we must, not may, but must deploy outside the stadiums, traffic control, crowd control, et cetera, uh, we are not reimbursed. That, that's on us. And when we detail police officers to those assignments, we detail them from the nine district stations. So when we take them from the nine district stations, that enhances it are, and, and adds really artificially to our sh staffing shortage. So now we're drafting a police officer to work overtime, to work patrol, because we took that patrol officer to send down to that special event. It, 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 this is an issue that other jurisdictions have figured out. And I know that the, um, that the mayor and her team is working really, really hard to, to have that conversation again with the, um, with the stadium authority and all the other events, councilmen in the city, uh, Preakness, 4th of July, uh, Light City, um, Artscape, I mean, I could go on and on. That, that's on us, too. There, there's, there, there's little to no reimbursement. Uh, that's unusual. So I, as a follow-up to finance, is that, or, or the, the administration, whoever can answer this, is that an agreement that, how often is that agreement renegotiated? Uh, Councilman, in this fiscal 18 budget, we have included a million dollars of estimated additional reimbursement, but that will require a renegotiation of the agreement. Uh, there's no time frame on the agreement, so this will require the cooperation of the Orioles and Ravens and the Stadium Authority. But this is an issue that um, you know we raised all the way back when Caroline worked in BBMR, and she studied it, and uh, we, we looked at what's the not just the issue of reimbursement you know, inside versus outside, but also what's the full cost of the service being provided? Uh, we're getting a flat $45 uh, overtime rate inside the stadium. The true cost is, is higher than that, so we'd like to discuss both, both issues with the, with the teams. And do, you, do you know what the true cost actually is? Have you calculated that? I mean, our estimate was um, it, it's about $2 million more than what we're being reimbursed. Uh, we've assumed a million in the budget to be conservative. Because again, this this is not so, a done deal sorry, until we just, can just, we can negotiate. So 1.9 unreimbursed is what we know about, and then you're saying an additional two million is it an uh, additional fringe, two million on top fringe, of that? Fuel, cars, maintenance, all, all that. So it's really close to the four million dollars. Yeah, well, my number active. my number includes a full cost calculation. So it's it's uh, I think what you have within there is based on. Um, a, I don't even, I'm not sure what you're looking at, but. I just going off of the, the, the statement earlier okay. that there was one point, one point yeah, nine million dollars unreimbursed. I'm not sure if that includes what we're talking about here or not. Uh, could, could we add that as a, a follow up uh, yes. to the committee to get a detailed impact of what that is? Yes. I mean, when we're, when we're talking about um, the impact on the budget. Council, can you um, just repeat that question yeah, for so me? So we know that there's $1.9 million unreimbursed by 
uh, special events that the, they were covering for, but then it was just to disclose that there may be an additional impact on fuel vehicles over time. Yeah. Um, so I, just trying to get an idea of the total cost. Sure, I, I can provide some clarity there because the 1.9 million was made here from BPD. And I'm also familiar with the um, study that Andrew's speaking of because I was the one that actually did that a couple of years ago when I worked in um, finance. So when I worked in finance, the study that he's referring um, to, we did do an analysis to determine the true cost and that includes um, overhead costs that we're not currently being billed for. What is currently billed for is um, the actual officer's um, overtime cost but there's other administrative costs such as the fuel and other things that does not get captured in that cost. Um, what you heard uh, Major Corbett state earlier today is that um, we do provide over 70,000 police hours um, supporting special events. Of those, 1.9 million um, is not reimbursed. 2.4 million is reimbursed. Um, of the 1.9 million that is unreimbursed, about 737 of that represents um, sporting events um, support for the uh, Orioles and Ravens. Wow. So between those two teams, oh, you said seven, over, around 700,000? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're almost $740,000 just for those two teams. And, and when was that study done? Um, okay, so the numbers that I'm giving to you just well, you know, now. You said you were part of finance. Yeah, yeah. When, so when I was, uh, I've you know been at BPD was? now for four years. Okay. So that analysis was done in the summer of 2013. And since then, it has been updated. I believe it was updated uh, last two, year. Last year, yeah. okay. Okay. Um, that just seems like a lot of money uh, when, we, when we're talking about the crunch that we're in. Uh, especially because the other DC and other major cities actually do cover that cost. Now, this sorry, just a follow up to um, the total amount that we're requesting. Does that also take into account overtime spent in on the district level uh, as well? Because that would obviously be an additional cost if you have officers that are covering the Ravens game. That means it's putting more pressure at. Southwest District to pay overtime is is that a part of this calculation? And, uh, no, so so that that's the true number. So we're gonna, that we don't know. We don't know that number. Well, we we can I'm sure put yeah, it together. Yes, we know that. But as we we're saying, that's the true cost. When you start looking at the the true cost, when we're saying it's the cost of the the officer's actual salary and all of that other admin, now you're throwing in that admin that you have to do the backfill at the district. And so that would so you do have that cost the, available? Yeah. Could you provide it to the committee? Absolutely. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, I have like 10 questions, but I've been told to shorten it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> let's try to figure out where to start. Okay. Um, so, this is a question for the commissioner. So, um, I was just a little bit confused about just the staffing of the administrative office. Um, so there's three deputy commissioner positions. Who, who are those folks? Who, who are they? Yeah. Oh, th so the three deputy commissioners, two of the three are here. Uh, Dean Paul Mears, the deputy commissioner. Okay. Jason Johnson is a deputy commissioner. Okay. Daryl D'Souza is a deputy commissioner. And this is new for Baltimore, so I, I didn't do a good job explaining it when we embarked upon this, but um, our profession has available to it internships. Uh, and one of the most prestigious internships in all of policing is at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the IACP. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, they're headquartered right in Alexandria, Virginia. So each year, the IACP selects about half a dozen uh, police executives to intern at IACP for a full year. So Deputy D'Souza has been there uh, for about 10 months. He returns in August with a wealth of experiences and best practices to bring back to the BPD. On June the 7th, our, our patrol chief, Mo Robinson, Osborne Robinson, returns after he graduates from the FBI National Academy. That's a, um, a prestigious um, assignment. Uh, only a few of us in our profession has, have been afforded the opportunity to attend it. And uh, Chief Melissa Hyatt this year participated in the Police Executive Research Forum's uh, Leadership Institute 
uh, that took her out of the city for several weeks as well. So these are training education opportunities that I believe an organization our size with the challenges we have, we would be, we would be foolish uh, not to pursue these opportunities, so. Okay, um, so just two follow-ups to that really short. So uh, are the internships covered by the organizations? Is there like a scholarship or does that come at a cost? Not that I'm against professional development, but. No, they're, they're, um, they, they continue to earn their salaries while they're away. And when they return, uh, your third commissioner, was he, what was he doing before and what would he be returning to? So when we've restructured uh, a couple times over the last two years, so we're on the verge of restructuring again as we prepare to go into the consent decree. So uh, by the end of this summer, uh, we will reorganize uh, one more time. And again, it's anticipation of the uh, consent decree and all the requirements that are gonna bring with it. So as soon as we have that restructuring done, we'll share that with the council. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, just trying to prioritize here. Um, Councilman, I'll come right back to you. Yeah, Let me, please do. Sorry. Councilman Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and to your team. Um, first of all, appreciate your advocacy on behalf of uh, changing the restrictions around marijuana convictions <coughs> to be an officer. Thank you. Um, I think that was needed change. Um, do want to reiterate some of the frustration that our president expressed about runaway overtime costs. Um, you know, it, it is challenging to our citizens uh, to see the level of overtime that is going out, um, given that we still have schools that are crumbling uh, given the sorry state of our streets, uh, the sorry state of much of our public housing in the city of Baltimore. Um, and so I just want to really reiterate the call. And I know and I've heard you say that uh, the contract and the staffing procedure is critically important. Um, but I do really want to reiterate the call that the amount of overtime that we've seen go out is just unacceptable to our citizens, um, and I would hope to you all as well. Uh, wanted to ask specifically about something that was lifted up in the DOJ report and then the consent decree around sexual assault. Uh, we know we've had some serious challenges with um, problematic investigation of sexual assault. This is something that the DOJ report was really clear on and that there were some uh, provisions put into the consent decree uh, to deal with, sex, with the reporting and investigations around sexual assault. Um, I was wondering if you could articulate uh, your strategy for how the BPD will improve <coughs> on that particular set of practices. So, Councilman, uh, thank you. Uh, your, I share your thoughts on overtime, and we're gonna look, we'll, we'll look ourselves in the mirror and get better, I promise you. The DOJ findings report covered a period of time from 2010 to 2015, and yep. uh, most of the time, if not all of the time, in, in the body of that report, it did not reference the calendar year when they were identifying a deficiency. We've come a long way with our sexual assault investigations. I, I think we've done a 180 with them. Um, the uh, processes that are in place to include now housing all of our investigators under one roof uh, at the Baltimore Child Abuse Center is a, is a best practice. Uh, we have a different command structure in place, different detectives in place. We have different um, oversight procedures in, in place. So a detective who makes a mistake intentionally or unintentionally, that mistake does just not linger uh, that allows a victim to, to get hurt uh, time after time. So I'll ask Chief Martin to just fill in the blanks a little bit, and then Steve O'Dell, Chief O'Dell, uh, where are we after Chief Martin with our, with, our, uh, with our backlog? I think we've made some strides there. Yeah, so to the police commissioner's um, point, there have been a, a lot of strides made by our, our new commander. Um, one of the things we did early on in, 
even the investigation is we hired a uh, expert and this person is actually a uh, monitor on another team um, that looks at um, sexual assault cases and when they looked at our cases they did find some deficiencies but the main thing that they found was that we weren't following what they said was a best practice uh, checklist that we had come up with mm -hmm. so what Captain Holman does now is he has um, bi-weekly I believe uh, meetings with all of his commanders or all those people that are under his command uh, to ensure that they're actually checking um, the boxes to make sure that they're going through the protocols as far as investigation goes. The other thing um, that was pointed out in the report was just how we uh, deal with victims of sexual assault. So um, a couple of months ago we had a, um, um, a announcement where we uh, created a trauma-informed care area um, for, for that. Um, additionally, within the, the first year, uh, which is going to come up probably in the next six months, um, we are uh, required to revise our policies and procedures um, according to uh, paragraph 258 um, in, the, uh, in the consent decree. Um, so there are a couple of things that we're already kind of moving forward on. Um, and certainly when um, the monitor comes, um, and once it's, they're selected and we um, come up with a monitoring plan, you'll be able to see and benchmark the improvements that we're going to make regarding the sexual assault investigations. And Chief Adel, before you go over the numbers, um, we're all probably familiar with, uh, with The Keepers on Netflix, the, the series about um, Keo in uh, 1969. And we put on our, our website, I think Chief Smith, we did that last week or so, uh, a way for sexual assault victims from the late 60s, early 70s who were students at that school or otherwise associated uh, or ran into uh, <coughs> a particular priest identified in that series so, so they can reach out even now to the BPD um, to, to have a voice and, and to, get us, to get us started. Yeah, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. I also, I, I, you know, all the evidence would suggest it is an underreported crime across the board. Um, particularly, and this is anecdotal, but recently in Southeast Baltimore within our immigrant community um, because of, and we've talked about this quite a bit, the frayed relationship um, caused by the ICE raids that have gone on in our communities. I'm hearing a lot about sexual assault that is not getting reported to you all within our immigrant communities. And so, you know, would definitely appreciate a very proactive maybe approach we, we, to just we involve you know. our uh, our SART team our sexual assault response team that's the BPD the state's attorney's office uh, mercy and advocates uh, maybe we can partner with them to do something specifically with that vulnerable population in the in the southeast yep. the, the last thing I'll add to your point and then I'll turn it, turn it over to Steve um, part of the consent decree is not only the police recognizing uh, issues and correcting them but it's how do we engage with the those communities to act better respond to those issues and so if there's groups or people that you want to put in contact with me so that they can be part of working groups as we as we move forward on new policies programs training and and reporting um, the, the the key to the consent decree being successful and sustainable is actually creating policies and programs that that um, speak to the um, the experiences of the the community. So we, we need all of that input as we move forward. Yeah, putting and, and Chief, I would just say that you know it, it's it's you all will have a lot of work to do to build trust um, with that community and with so many communities in our city. Councilman Cohen, if I could add one thing, um, a point to uh, the anxiety with particularly in the Hispanic community with immigration and whatnot. Uh, we, we've implemented, um, and the commissioners actually selected a Hispanic liaison that has been working with our investigative units um, and they're offering them other options. So even if they're, they're still anxiety to report to directly to police, we give them other options such as Jane Doe and, and so forth. But uh, that, that communication is very important. Appreciate that. And it, just to be clear, though, not just our Hispanic community. Uh, we have multiple Absolutely. Immigrant sure. I was using that as an example. Sure. So the, uh, just to add to the, a uh, little bit to the numbers and, and such, the, um, since the commissioner has been in charge, we've had a uh, significant change in, in the number of kits that have been uh, submitted and tested. So uh, even when that came out, we were testing 15 to 16 out of every 17 or 18 that were coming in a month. 
um, in the laboratory at this time. And at the, actually the time the report came out, we had no backlog uh, for rape kit testing, which surprised a lot of people, I think. Um, and that is defined as a kit that is outstanding more than 30 days. So we had zero, and we still, right now to this day, have zero in terms of uh, rape kit testing. Um, otherwise, uh, some of the other changes, we, I'm on the SART team um, that would work on some of this, and we've, and we've done some of that. And I was just recently appointed to the uh, Maryland Sexual Assault Evidence Kit Policy and Funding Committee, which was uh, started from the committee that was tasked uh, by the Attorney General for um, standardizing practices, which the ending report for that were majority our practices. So everything that came out in that to standardize the state are from BPD. So um, it, we've come a long way from the 2010 to 2015 time frame that you're reading about. Mm -hmm. So you can feel confident about, about those facts. I would just say, um, you know, I think it is one of the real challenges when I talk to folks about why they don't trust the police. Um, it, you know, it, it often goes back to concerns about sexual assault, rape kits, all the rest. Um, so I would just strongly encourage you all to continue to um, build those practices and uh, you know, follow best practices across the country. And again, um, you know, we, we do not want to go back to having a situation where um, particularly women, but all sorts of victims are feeling like they're not being listened to by the police. Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks everybody for being here. This is a long hearing. Um, glad we're wrapping it up. Um, I'll just, for the record, share a little bit of my experience firsthand with the police department. Um, at about 24 years old, uh, I was pulled over by officers for uh, no reason given. I had myself and my passengers illegally searched. Um, the reason apparent was being white in a black neighborhood at the time. About a year after that, I was again uh, stopped by the exact same officer in the exact same place and not only was uh, illegally searched, but had property of mine illegally seized, uh, it actually cost me money to get my license uh, reissued as a result of that. Um, again, no officer, no reason was given just being white in a black neighborhood. Um, as a white male with great privilege that comes along with that, I can only imagine um, what happens to black men uh, for being black in a white neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, I don't have to imagine that. It's everyday occurrences in Baltimore City. Um, I have also waited for two and a half, three hours for police responses at my home, only to be um, insisted to by a rookie officer that he was not going to and did not need to write a report for me after waiting for that length of time. Um, I have also I've had numerous experiences with the Baltimore City Police Department that I found utterly, utterly unacceptable and um, do not reflect well on its uh, history. Um, so I kind of come from that uh, background as a lifelong city resident and um, one whose experience I imagine is um, reflective of many people's experience in Baltimore City. Um, with that, I want to understand, um, I'll share one other thing that's happened since I've been in this position. Uh, one April morning, I woke up to an email and a voice message to the effect that um, a gentleman called me and he said, I've been trying to get a copy of a police report for the last week and a half. I've been calling the officer who wrote the report every day and have not been hearing back from him. I need the police report as soon as possible so that I can file an insurance claim because I desperately need the money so that I can make 
a settlement payment on a house that I'm buying that I had the money for at the time that I put it under contract, but had to spend uh, unexpectedly to bury my wife who was murdered by our son. And he didn't even get a call back for a week and a half under those kind of circumstances. I really need people to understand that people in Baltimore City are operating under really strenuous circumstances in a lot of cases. And things like simply being able to get a report when they need one matter in people's everyday life. And so I want to talk about uh, something that I've brought up in hearings in the past here, and I'd like to try to get a little bit more of an answer than I've gotten there, and that's what this pro reporting process looks like. What it means to call for an officer at your home and have them show up and know that when they leave, there's going to be a permanent record that somebody can go back to when they need it. What happens when a report gets made in Baltimore City? And then I want to talk about how that's going to change under the uh, capacity to do in-field electronic reporting. So field-based reporting, Councilman, will solve a lot of that. Uh, field-based reporting was introduced to most American police departments in the 1990s. I had the first mobile data computer in my police car in 1998. Uh, so for whatever reason, it just hasn't been a priority in Baltimore. And, and it is now. So when it comes to the uh, availability of police reports, field-based reporting is an immediate dissemination, electronic dissemination of a police report to a records management system that will ultimately uh, ensure that its availability will be much faster than it is right now because we still use pen and paper. So there's a the human frustration element when it comes to um, when it comes to police officers or, or any other person in any profession not adhering to the rules and policies and procedures and we think we've done a lot over the last two years to share with the community that if they're frustrated with a police experience and it doesn't have to be a misconduct experience that's certainly the most egregious uh, but it can be a frustration with not getting a copy of a report there are so many ways to get in touch with the BPD now that we advertise on our website and social media. Um, because we know that one bad experience, if it's not resolved with a citizen, uh, lives with a person forever. So for the bad experiences that you had as a young man with the police, I'm sorry you had those experiences. You, you're right, you certainly are not the only one. And the folks that are in front of you now are committed to bringing better policing to, to this great city. Um, so specifically, uh, maybe I'll ask Deputy Palmier to talk specifically about, um, it, it depends on what type of report you're talking about, whether it's a accident report or a crime report, but um, you wanna try to tackle yeah. that so, one, D? So the, the process as it works with the paper system, essentially depending on what crime occurred, uh, the officer's required to take a report, He'll ask the dispatcher for a report number. What the complainant receives immediately is what we call a Form 309. It basically um, is a pamphlet that has the complaint number, the officer's name, the officer's sequence number, the date of the incident, and then in that pamphlet it contains um, various uh, information about obtaining police reports and so forth. Uh, all that, again, is available on the website. Um, but f the, the reason that that occurs is because we are on a paper system. So when that officer generates uh, through our CAD system a complaint number, there is an electronic record of the call for service, the dispatch, and the history of that call. What the officer is required to do at that point is put pen to paper and document the incident as it was described by the complainant. He then... Can I so I just, I, I want to get kind of a timeline. Yeah, here. so the timeline I is. call from my house about right. uh, somebody smashed my window. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I call and the 911 operator takes that call and I get transferred to dispatch or they send it to dispatch and. The, yeah, so the 911 operator takes the call. Mm -hmm. As they're getting the information, they're forwarding that, in, in, they're forwarding the information <coughs> electronically to dispatch. Okay, and so that generates a number from the operator yes. that goes to the dispatcher, and that gets then associated also with a CAD number? Yes. 
Okay, so then we've got two numbers. We've got a call number and we've got a CAD number. You get it? Yeah, exactly. Call number, which is entered into 911. It's transferred up to CAD, generates a CAD number. The call is dispatched, depending on the call for service. If it requires a report, then you generate a complaint number. Okay, so then there's a complaint number. How does that differ from a CAD number? The CAD is simply for um, CAD management. Complaint number is for <coughs> UCR crime reporting and our tracking pur purposes. It's All a right. me metric of so, written reports. The officer comes to my house um, with a call number and a CAD number, and I complain somebody threw a brick through my window. Mm -hmm. Now he's got a complaint number. Correct, for a malicious destruction. What then? So he'll take, he'll basically what he'll have to do is write the report on paper. On a piece of paper that is not a triplicate form. It's, it is a triplicate form. I so. have received a number of, I have asked for reports and whenever I get one, it's on because a single eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that's bifolded. Yes. And that, it's got all the information down here. That's the form 309. So that's the form 309. That's yeah. not a triplicate form. That's uh, a single form. Exactly. Exactly. That that's the form 309. So the actual police report that the officer writes, mm -hmm. it, it is um, a transparency report. But the reason you don't receive that report immediately is because it has to go through an approval process. So that report then goes to the supervisor. Okay, so, so they take this piece of paper, <coughs> they write down this information on it, mm -hmm. they give it to me. Yes. They no longer have that information because they wrote it on a piece of paper and gave it to me. They have it. What else do they have to do? They have to write the report. They have to write the report. Where do they write that? Uh, generally in, in their car on post, the supervisor then collects reports. And this is again, you know, an and antiquated never, system. I've, and I've never seen that happen. You're, I've only right. ever seen that it gets written down on a little spiral bound mm -hmm. notepad. Right. Um, so basically the officer will so take they do his that. Notes. Yeah, but then they go to the car, they'll go to the car and they write something else down. They write an actual report that they'll keep in a clipboard or a file within the car. Okay, so they make their notes and then they go and transfer those notes to their actual report. Councilman, we'll be glad to give you a one-on-one -on -one tour of records management. That's walk okay. You through this. That's not necessary for this purpose. Um, and I know we talked about this last time too. And Councilman, yeah. I, I, trust me, this isn't a good system. That's why we are looking forward to electronic. Yeah, yeah, sure. You have to invest in police. You have I, to invest. And, and we're writing. I'm not. We're writing reports with an ink pen with all due respect, and a piece of I paper. I want to go. I want to try to finish this a little bit. Okay. That report goes to a supervisor for approval? Yes. How long does it take an officer, I mean, a, a supervisor to re review a report? Depending, it, again, it, it's done by the end of his tour of duty, but again, depending That day? On, yes. Every time? Most, yes, most, most of the time. I will not guarantee every day, but within the next morning when he comes back in, next shift. What would prohibit part, it from being reported? If uh, it's a reviewed. part one crime report, they're required to do it by the end of their tour of duty. What's a part one crime? Uh, UCR part one crimes, homicide, uh, aggravated assault, robbery, persons against crime, or crimes against persons, basically, part one crime. Okay. I did see part one crime somewhere in the uh, notes that you gave. Average time minutes to enter part one report <coughs> into record management system, 20 minutes. That's what time, that's, this is in the records management section of the report here. Okay. Councilman, that's the amount of time it takes for a data entry clerk to enter each individual report upon its arrival at the records management section. That's that metric. A data entry clerk. That's correct. They enter the report into a records management system? That's correct. Is Count that? Councilman, I, I think that this is important to discuss. I, and okay, okay, un understood, but, but I'm. So we, we were gonna offer again, if you wanna come over and we'll give you the full tour of this. I, I, it's pertinent to the discussion of the budget. Okay, is there, I, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna go back to you, Councilman, right now. Yep. I'm going to ask that you wrap up and get to what the question is that's germane to the budget discussion. Commissioner, thank you for making that offer. And I would appreciate, Commissioner, if your office would 
follow up with Councilman Dorsey at a later time, whether he chooses to or not uh, to take that tour. Councilman. So a supervisor has to review the report and then what do they pass it to a data entry clerk? So th those reports are ultimately transported from the district down to uh, headquarters where our records management system is. A, a clerk within the records management section again reviews that report and, and does the data entry for UCR crime report. How much of this time is going to be saved by the implementation of the electronic field reporting process? It, it would save, and Commissioner, I don't want to answer for you, but it's a game changer. It <laughs> yeah. changes the game. Yeah. The Pony <laughs> Express is over, right? right? It's an elect immediate electronic dissemination. I sit in my patrol car, I type it on my mobile data computer, I send it to my, my sergeant, my sergeant reads and appro approves it, and my sergeant <coughs> sends it to record management immediately. And we don't need someone to input data because the report stands on its own. So can you give me a ballpark of the percentage of the time in total for the officer to handwrite the report um, rewrite the report for him, handwrite the complaint, the 309, mm -hmm. write the report up, have a, a, a data entry clerk. What percentage of that total time are we talking about saving? 80%? Yeah, uh, at least three quarters. Easily, uh, easily mm -hmm. three quarters. It's 20th century technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to talk, I want to come back to that in just a second. Um, the current collective bargaining agreement has in it a schedule. I understand that it's a priority for everybody to get that schedule out of the collective bargaining agreement. That schedule required a certain number of officers, on, requires a certain number of officers on patrol at any given time. Am I correct about that? Yes. Is that number of officers an adequate number based on the current uh, demands of our reporting system? The reporting system doesn't dictate uh, the current. The case, reporting system didn't, has a lot to do with the efficiency of our workforce. So is the so that's a statement. Did, did that ahead. number of patrol officers uh, get determined? within the framework of the demands of the inefficiencies of our reporting process? Absolutely not. If, if it was as simple as I think you're getting at, um, we would have figured this out many, many years ago. There is a demand for police services in the city of Baltimore that's coupled with a demand in your council district and others for the visibility and presence of police. And then there's also a demand that we place on police officers to proactively fight crime by identifying people who are engaged in suspicious activities. So the, the 20th century technology that will eventually land in Baltimore in 2017 won't necessarily reduce the, the need for having more police officers. And you and, I may, you and I may fundamentally disagree about that, and I'm prepared to accept that, but field-based reporting won't reduce the need for more police officers in Baltimore. We have a demand of police in our city uh, that we can't keep up with right now. And that's not going away anytime soon. What we're talking about is essentially the equivalent of having four times as many officers on the street because three quarters of their time and productivity. That's an oversimplification, Councilman. And, and, I, and I know you're getting frustrated with me because I'm getting frustrated with you. That's an oversimplification. And I'd be glad to spend some time with you in BPD headquarters to go over a lot of these issues uh, at length. And we're not talking simply, every call for service is not a report. Councilman, I'm, I'm going to have to respectfully ask you to wrap it up, please. I will move on from that and just ask for closure rates on um, larceny from auto calls. How many calls we get and have officers respond to versus how many uh, arrests that directly relates to? We'll, we'll get back to you on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
we're going to go to Councilman Burnett for a extremely quick question. Uh, Commissioner, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. OB from my office bought me a Diet Coke. Um, I've been drinking about 12 of these a day to get through these, these hearings. And for some reason, it says Davis on it. I don't know if that was intentional or not. It must have just been the one that came out the vending machine. Councilman Burnett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> so I saw, so I actually have 1.5 questions. One is really quick. Uh, there was 1.8 million allocated for uh, casino support, uh, of which that represents an increase of 105,000. Does the casino reimburse the city for, for that dedicated expense? Major Corbett, we do have overtime officers working there in the casino do reimburse a portion of that. Do you, do you know how much what the portion is or would you be able to provide that to the committee? Yeah. Te technically, the, it, it's funded with casino impact aid from the state. Okay. Uh, so that was my half question. Uh, the other uh, half question, um, do you know how much has been expended uh, in FY17 in overtime? Uh, and what was what is budgeted for fiscal year 18 at the casino, at the casino. no no, no um, just in general overall oh I'm sorry I, I don't have a follow-up after that I just want to know the number oh, oh, okay so um, our overall overtime spending uh, for our uh, general fund daily um, as of uh, May 13 we are at uh, 39.5 million and I couldn't find and maybe this is a question for finance I was trying to figure out how much was budgeted for the next for the coming fiscal year so 16.5 uh, million Thank you. Are you good, Councilman Brenner? Yes, thank Councilman you. Scott. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm glad to see you didn't leave in my absence and my return. Uh, Commissioner, I just want to talk briefly about the ceasefire program. Uh, this morning, we had a presentation from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, well, the Mayor's Chief of Staff, as there is no ex Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and they gave us the impression that the Police Department uh, may have want to walk away from that program. I don't think that that is something that you guys would do or push to do. Now, I personally believe that the program should have never been put directly under you, that it made more sense to put it under health, much like we did Safe Streets. Could you talk about the status of that program? So, Councilman, we're continuing to have a conversation with the mayor and her staff, both about ceasefire and uh, safe streets. So it's an ongoing conversation. Yes, sir. That's all I can say. Thank you. That's my only question. Thank you, Councilman Scott. Um, Commissioner, we're going we're gonna to get you out of here in a minute. Um, one, I want to take, uh, we, we've done 47 hours of hearings over the last four days. Um, um, one, I want to say uh, thank you to my colleagues, Councilman Scott, Burnett, Dorsey, Pinkett, um, Bullock, um, Cohen, and uh, Sneed. Really appreciate you guys staying until the end. Um, this council really wants to get a deal done with this administration. We do. We're committed to that. Uh, we're committed to being partners with the mayor. We know that the mayor wants to work with us, and we appreciate that. Uh, and I'm confident we're going to get a deal done on Monday. Um, that being said, this council is extremely serious about its priorities. Um, I'm not going to hash up any, any um, bad blood that's occurred over the past couple days. Uh, but our priorities are our priorities, and we treat them very seriously. And uh, they're a big part of what we've been discussing tonight about crime prevention, about funding our youth, about budgeting. Budgeting is an activity and prioritization. Uh, and we budget with our values, and that's how everyone on this council treats it. Uh, and we think it's important to fund city schools. We think it is important to have after school and community school programs funded, fully funded. Uh, we think it's important to fund the food bank, uh, to make sure that we're getting meals to our low-income seniors. Uh, we believe it's important to fund safe streets unanimously, no question about it. We think AARP Experience Corps, where we're bringing our seniors into schools to help get our students to grade level, uh, by third grade and literacy is critically important. 
we believe that the University of Maryland Cooperative Extension is important. All those things are important to us. Um, and, and our values, we believe, are the mayor's shared values. We share those values with the mayor. We know how the mayor feels about youth. We're appreciative for um, the, the Herculean effort that the mayor made in Annapolis. Um, but that, that was a month and a half ago. That's Annapolis. Now we're here now. Uh, and, and this budget is right now happens to be the city council's, not the mayor's. Um, and we want to get this budget out. We want to vote this budget out um, as is. We want to give it back to you so that the mayor can sign it into law and we can get back to working together and helping to move our city forward. Uh, so we're committed to that. Uh, I know I can speak for the council president when I say we're going to keep lines of communication open. Uh, this committee is going to reconvene on Monday. Uh, May, uh, June 5th, pardon me, I lost track of the month, uh, at 4 p.m. I know we've got a meeting scheduled in the afternoon, early afternoon on Monday. Um, we're going to come to that meeting with an open mind, uh, and, and it's my belief that cooler heads are going to prevail and we're going to get a deal done. Um, I'd like to thank um, Marguerite Kern first for setting this room up and providing the fruit snacks and Diet Coke and, and taking care of us all week and all these presentations. I'd like to thank Kim Trueheart uh, and Baby Ray, the only two citizens that don't work for a city agency that have stuck through uh, most of this process. Uh, I want to thank my vice chair, Leon Pinkett, who has done an absolutely excellent job and has been a great partner. Charm TV for filming all of this and, and dealing with our insane schedule that I came up with, which the council president has still not forgiven me for. Uh, I want to thank Karen Stokes and Karan Banks from the mayor's office. Uh, through all of this frustration um, and madness, you have um, uh, dealt in good faith and been helpful and tried to help us get to the finish line, and the city council appreciates you. Um, and I want to thank uh, Council President Young and his staff, and especially Kara Kuntz from Council President's office. Uh, with that, we're going into recess until uh, Monday, uh, June 5th at uh, have one quick question. I'm good. Councilman Dorsey. This is a question for Mr. Klein. The, um, I would like an itemized list of the monetary value of the paid leave bank of 300 days per year that is created for uh, members of the lodge of the FOP, as well as the monetary value of the salary paid to the uh, president of the FOP who is on who is given full-time administrative leave as well as the others on full-time administrative leave from duty to the Baltimore City of Police Department. <coughs> Thank you. Right, I'm sorry. I, I, we're now in recess.